Hi, my name is Chris Brennan, and you're listening to the Astrology Podcast. This is episode 173, and in this episode, Lisa Scheim and I are going to be answering questions from listeners of the podcast that have been sent in over the past few days. Uh, hey, Lisa, welcome back to the show. Hey, Chris. I think this is your second episode this month. Yes, that's true. Yeah, well, it feels good to be back recording in the studio again, so we're trying to do more studio episodes lately. Mm hmm um, we're also celebrating a little bit of an anniversary of some sort or a milestone because the YouTube channel for the Astrology Podcast is about to hit 50,000 subscribers. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty exciting because when I switched to do it, started doing video just a few years ago, several years into the run of the podcast, I didn't know if it would work or not or if people would subscribe to the channel or what have you. Right. And I know you'd wish that you had, in retrospect, moved it you know, to YouTube even earlier. So it's nice yeah. that it's grown so much. There's a ton of old episodes that I wish that I had um, video versions of, and I've been slowly rolling out just like audio only versions on YouTube. But like the interview with Jeffrey Cornelius, some of the early House Division episodes, some of the early episodes with Kelly and Austin, uh, I definitely wish I had video of, but I'm sort of making up for lost time since then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we got to have them out here last what no november last november yeah it doesn't doesn't look like we're going to be able to this november but yeah, yeah. well <laughs> hopefully, hopefully again hopefully next year yeah all right so let's get to some questions so these were questions that were submitted uh either on twitter or on our private page on patreon or some of them came in through facebook mm -hmm. i put out a call for questions a couple days ago and we got tons of questions as usual we have more questions than we have time to answer yeah but we tried to pick out some of the best ones. There were also some that were good questions, but we had already answered in previous Q&As because I've been doing Q&As on the podcast for years. So just mm -hmm. go to the podcast website and do a search and you'll find some of those past Q&As or some of the past questions that are similar that we've already answered. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we were able to find some good ones for today. Yes, I think so too. Okay. Any other prelim preliminaries before we get started? Um, No, I don't think so. All right. Well, let's jump into it. Okay. All right. Um, first things first, a variation of this. And did you find the exact question about the natal versus horary thing? No. So someone did ask this, but um, we don't have it attributed here as to who. Okay. So I see this come up a lot where sometimes it's stated that, because most people learn natal astrology first, especially if you're learning modern astrology, modern astrology is mainly directed towards natal. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes when people start learning traditional astrology, they especially if they're studying Renaissance traditions or if they start studying horary, one of the like um, one of the promotional like statements that horary astrologers sometimes say is they say, well, you were always supposed to learn horary first in traditional astrology and natal afterwards. And sometimes new students of horary will like repeat this statement, which is kind of like a propaganda statement on the part of the horary astrologers. Um, but it's not necessarily true. It's true maybe in some portions, for example, that William Lilly in his book Christian Astrology, it's divided into three books. And in the first part, he does basic concepts. Then in the second part, he does horary. Then in part three, he does natal. Mm -hmm. So for Lilly, that's definitely true. But there were other astrologers even in his era that said that you should learn natal first. And if you go back into prior eras, um, especially about a thousand years back into the Hellenistic tradition, it's pretty much all um, natal astrology. Mm -hmm. So natal was, to me, one of the, the main counter arguments is that most of the basic concepts of traditional astrology were built up around natal astrology in the Hellenistic period, and that's where we get most of the techniques from, including most of the significations of the houses. And then later on, um, electional was part of that, and eventually horary developed as a fourth branch by the medieval period. Mm -hmm. um, but just historically, it's not necessarily true. So I don't think there's anything wrong with learning horary first, but mm -hmm. it's not necessarily the, true to say that you have to or you should or that there's an overriding traditional precedent. Right. And I so I think there's also there's those historical arguments, you know, it's like who did what in the past. Um I think it's also an interesting argument in either way in that not all astrologers do both natal and horary. I've seen people who only do horary, I've seen people who only do natal. Electional is rarely mentioned in this mix, um, but it's another thing that some astrologers do. Mm -hmm. So um, there's certainly transferable techniques and skills that can lend to each other when you know different approaches to astrology, not different approaches, but like different applications of astrology. Right. Um, 
But it's not really something where you ever need to learn one of them first. I think, you know, each of them brings different sort of positive attributes, learning one first, and then that transfers to the other. And they're different depending on which order you do. So I don't know. Yeah, I don't think that it's a necessity thing. I mean, I guess is there's something to be said for like the scope of horary is much more limited because it's focused on a single specific question typically, Mm -hmm. and the rules for approaching how to answer that question are somewhat limited Mm -hmm. to a certain extent, and that the primary way that you're answering questions is looking if the ruler of of house A is applying to an aspect with house B with the ruler of house B, and if it is, then the answer is yes, and if it's not, then the answer is no. So to that extent, that does introduce a bunch of traditional concept and make you get familiar with the idea of like rulers of houses and dignity and debility and interpreting things in a very literal way, the Mm -hmm. symbolism in a literal way that's maybe a good bridge to um, to traditional astrology and that it helps you to not immediately jump towards just interpreting things psychologically. For sure. So maybe in that way, there's a good argument for learning horary relatively early in one's studies. Mm-hmm. But um, I don't know, for me, like I did horary a lot in the latter part of the last decade, like 10 years ago, mm-hmm. but I really moved away from it just because I found natal to be much more interesting and much deeper in its sort of significance and ability to speak to people's lives because it's something that applies to the entirety of a person's life and not just a single question. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, I think horary can be kind of exciting in terms of its literalness, in terms of its concreteness, in terms of its, you know, very narrow specificity and like this means this. And I think that's probably a piece of where people can get really excited about like you should definitely learn this first and then you can go from there. But Mm -hmm. um, they're just different. You know, I mean, there's there's crossover and there are differences. And so, yes, in natal, there's a broader spectrum of how different placements can play out, I think, because the scope, like you said, is someone's whole life versus like a narrow question. Um, yeah, I don't think either of them have to be sort of prioritized or, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely something you should learn and add to your like toolbox at some point in your studies mm-hmm. and not something to stay away from. Um, but yeah, it's good to learn all of the branches. And I think for me, to the extent that most of Western astrology originally developed largely in a natal context, that's the best starting point, especially if you have an accurate birth time for yourself, since that's most people's starting point is studying Mm -hmm. natal astrology. Right. You can definitely observe it more around you, um, you know, in yourself and other people's lives around you, your friends, your family, versus questions you do need to solicit and that kind of thing. Right. Um, So speaking of horary astrology, there was actually one of our questions was submitted by a brilliant horary astrologer who I know you did a horary chart from, which is Rob Bailey. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, so he, uh, what was that question again? Because that was Let actually me find really. This. That, well, I know the yeah. question, but what was that horary chart? Because oh. <laughs> that was like a really good example of of horary working out in practice, right? Yeah. Um, I had asked how things would go in the long term if I'm trying to remember the specific wording of it, but how things would go in the long term if I decided to quit my day job to only do astrology for work within maybe I said within the next six months, something like that. Mm-hmm. Um. And it was, I don't know, a couple years ago or something, give or take. It was almost two years ago, I think. And the chart was actually really positive. And it's funny because I had asked time-limited ones like that before, mm-hmm. um, and they didn't. They weren't good. And it was like that was not the right timing for that. You know, I, I didn't ask them like in quick succession. It was like a while would pass. And I'm like, okay, how about now? <laughs> um, and this one turned out to be really good. And you know, the specific um, symbolism was perfect. And I was like, okay. And that actually did help me give the co- get the confidence to kind of make that leap. I'd been doing it part-time alongside another job. Mm. So, um, and yeah, it's worked out well and matched the chart really well. Yeah. Um, and you quit your day job like literally last year to do astrology full-time mm-hmm. and, and it's been going pretty well now. Yeah. Um, so Rob sent, the, sent this question in uh, on Twitter, his hashtag, his name is at old school astro on Twitter. Um, so people should definitely reach out for Hori questions because he did a good job mm-hmm. of answering that one very specifically. Yeah. He says, I'm interested in your views on the importance of counseling skills when employing traditional predictive techniques. How do we deal with the seemingly deterministic nature of these techniques without robbing the client of hope or agency? Mm-hmm. So that's a really good question because it hits like a few different points. Um, yeah. 
I mean, so some one piece of that is the determ- seemingly deterministic nature of traditional techniques, which yeah. it's true. It does narrow down um, kind of the the possibilities rather than having like a huge swath of possibilities. Traditional techniques are known for being more specific. Mm-hmm. Um, the other one it touches on is counseling skills. Yes. And this is a part that I'm actually nervous about, and I've expressed this a few times in the past, where um, you know none of us that have gotten that got into traditional astrology more than five or ten years ago, um, we all had to start with modern for the most part, with very rare exceptions. Like I think one exception might be Ryan Butler may have very quickly gotten into like William Lilly, mm-hmm. but for the most part, like like me and Austin and Kelly and you. We all started with modern astrology. We're relatively well steeped in that, at least for a few years, for me, for at least four or five years before getting into traditional astrology and learning that, unlearning some portions of modern astrology, like reconstructing our understanding of astrology, and then in the end, basically coming out with some sort of like hybrid approach. Mm-hmm. But one of the things that's good about that that's, that makes me nervous for those who now are able to to start learning astrology and jump right into it is not getting some of the sensibilities that come with the modern preoccupation with consulting skills, which was like a huge thing in the 70s and 80s and early 90s, in which you'll get like a heavy dose of if you're reading, especially authors like Stephen Arroyo or Howard Sesportis or um, Liz Green, and this preoccupation, especially with like not harming the client and being conscientious of how some of the things that you could say could affect a client psychologically. Mm-hmm. And I think that got baked into a lot of our traditional astrology. And it's one of the things that carries over even once we've picked up a bunch of modern or ancient techniques is having that sensitive sensitivity to some extent as well. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And it's kind of an interesting to th- thing to think about in terms of going forward, like pe- more people learning only traditional or traditional first. Right. Um, that there will be like advantages, but there could be disadvantages as well. And this right. might be one area where there could be some. It could be. Um, I mean, I think you, at least if you're a somewhat sensitive person, can kind of learn on the job. I mean, obviously, astrology as a whole isn't certified in terms of having to take counseling classes, you know? Mm-hmm. And I feel like I've personally, as I've done more and more consultations, have just gotten kind of better at how to conduct you know, a conversation around topics that could be sensitive. Right. Um, yeah. And, you know, I don't know if you want to get into specifics about, you know, things you might do around that. I mean, he was just asking in general, like the importance of counseling skills Mm -hmm. and, um, dealing with the seemingly deterministic nature of these techniques without robbing the client of hope or agency. I mean, that's one thing, um, is, you know, wanting to, even as the astrologer, no matter how sure you are about a specific outcome, having to acknowledge a range of possible outcomes. Mm-hmm. And in, in that, there's something still approaching free will, even for the most deterministic astrologer, in that you don't know the exact way, especially if you're working with natal astrology, where the, the possibilities and different manifestations of a transit or something are so broad. Um, you you want to leave a little bit of open endedness, and in that, the client perhaps you know has greater choice or agency to hopefully aim for the better manifestation of that rather than the worse. Mm-hmm. I think there's also something to be said for you know having something out there that shows your particular approach to astrology, and that you are maybe using a little more traditional techniques, so people know upfront that they're coming to you. The people that are coming to you hopefully want some of that. You know, I think that makes a huge difference just to, just to begin with. Yeah. Um, like I mean, I, it's interesting even in the past year or two just seeing how many people, newer astrologers are putting like Hellenistic astrologer in their bio mm-hmm. and that that's become a catch thing, um, which is fine. And it's just really interesting to me as somebody who's like into that for a long time and it's like mm-hmm. nobody knew what that was or, right. or anything, but now it's uh, it's like a catchy, catchy thing to- yeah denote I'm still trying to understand what that denotes I think it primarily denotes that they use like whole sign houses in whole sign and houses and traditional rulerships and maybe, maybe per- perfections yeah or things like that maybe zodiac releasing mm-hmm. yeah yeah so I mean I think it's you know yes a label is helpful but also not everyone knows what that means if they're just a client you know and not fully into astrology so 
um, having writings out there, having podcasts out there, something that shows how you talk about astrology, mm -hmm. I think is really helpful in drawing the clients to you who want that particular approach. And that's true in general, but also specific to this question, I think. Like I've had a lot of client, a surprising number of clients uh, have come to me and said right off the bat, like that they're really into stoicism or, you know, things like that. And that they, or that they want more often than that. It's like, I don't want things sugarcoated. Stoicism, who says that? Like they're really into no, stoicism? No, I've had people okay. tell me that. <laughs> I'm I mean, not making I'm that up. <laughs> very, I'm not criticizing that. I'm very into stoicism myself, but again, yeah. that's very lone voice in the crowd for like a long time. For sure. You know, 10 years ago, I cleared out a lot of rooms uh, giving <laughs> right. talks on that at astrology conferences. You're like, yay, stoicism. And people are like, mm. yeah. <laughs> when they go to this Mark Jones talk. <laughs> right. So, I mean, I, I do think that's a that's really important because then people actually want what you have to give. And you maybe can be a little more like, this is what I see. But I think you always have to be cautious about the range of potential manifestations natally anyway. Mm -hmm. And um I mean, the other piece that this reminds me of is that fairly often something will already be in process around things that if you're talking about the next six months or the next year of someone's life, some transits or things like that have already started, perfection years have started sometimes. And so it's not always like you have to deliver all this information that's completely unknown to the person. And it's, it is often a conversation about, you know, what's already going on so far and then what else could that lead to? Yeah, and learning what their current trajectory is. And then once you understand the trajectory better, you're able to combine that with the astrology to then project forward like what the likely um, like outcome is going to be in certain areas. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Obviously, one of the common things though that you deal with there is it's much harder than to do a consultation with like a young person versus an old person because mm -hmm. an older person has already gone through it all and both the good things as well as the bad things. For the most part, they already know mm -hmm. pretty well some of the major themes of their life. And they can just, you just do the reading and go through the checklist of like, yeah, that happened, that happened, right. this happened, that was terrible, that was a good area of my life, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. With a young person, though, that's tricky because there's a lot that simply hasn't happened yet, um, which can be frustrating. But that that's mm -hmm. also where the consulting skills come in. Um, but to circle back to that, it's kind of, important because a lot of astrologers just get that training on the job and they learn from doing, but there are different ways that you can get some consult consulting skills or mm -hmm. counseling skills. And that is probably a good thing to add to your training as an astrologer, mm -hmm. even if you learn it in a non-astrological context, but just learning some basic counseling skills. Right. Or various certifications sometimes offer that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I know ESAR has some consulting skills training. Yep. Um, I think OPA has a little bit as well. Mm -hmm. um, and some of those are a bit more geared to astrologers. And Mark Jones, we've talked about that on the show before, and he has some training, although he's more, more modern and less predictive. So, mm -hmm. um, but it's still good things to know in, in terms of that. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, when what this also makes me think about specifically is when you're talking about the range of one of the sort of concrete ways you can go about this in consultations is when you're talking about the range of possibilities that might come from a specific astrological configuration coming up for someone. Mm -hmm. um, you can kind of mention things that are kind of on the better or more neutral side or, you know, um, things that are the kind of harder possibilities. You can mention several of them in passing. You know, and I know that I've done that sometimes when I'm concerned about like a potential worst case scenario coming about. Mm -hmm. I will mention it in passing usually, unless it's something like really dire, um, so that it's clear that I haven't glossed over it if something like that does come to pass. Um, but I also try not to dwell on like the the worst possibilities. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Not dwelling on it. Although this year is funny because then of yeah. course. This year has been a lesson, especially in terms of like the mundane astrology in what happens if you if you aren't sometimes mm -hmm. clear about what the astrology looks like and that there's like a lot of tough stuff coming up down the down the pipe. Yeah, for um, sure. Yeah, like I remember we put out our horoscopes and in, uh, in like January and in February mm -hmm. there was somebody that wrote in on Instagram that complained that I've talked about before that was like this seems really heavy and I wish I hadn't like seen this mm -hmm. because um, it seems like there's a lot of difficult stuff and you didn't really sugarcoat it enough for my tastes. Mm -hmm. And then they actually just wrote me back like a few days ago <laughs> after a series of like their wedding was canceled and mm -hmm. 
now there's like health stuff coming up and she's mm -hmm. kind of like, yeah, right. Uh, that <clears throat> right. was a good call. However, it wasn't pleasant at the time or something and mm -hmm. still this ongoing dialogue about um, realism and wanting to be clear when challenging stuff is coming up and not lie to the client while mm -hmm. at the same time not freaking out the client, not overly depressing them and not creating a like self-fulfilling prophecy by saying something that they then somehow create because they're convinced that it's inevitable. Yeah, definitely. And I think you also have to gauge in conversation where your client is at in terms of anxiety and things like that. Right. Like you can usually get a decent sense through some conversation talking with a client, you know, how grounded are they? And or sometimes they'll straight out say like you know, I don't want things sugarcoated or I'm not really worried about you telling me bad things or stuff like that. You know, that can still not be 100% true just because we're human. You know, we still don't want to hear bad things. But mm -hmm. um, you can kind of get a sense and gauge it a little bit from there as to how I think it's just proportional, you know, like what you kind of land on, what you talk about for longer, things like that. Right. Yeah. Um, the other final thing that this brings up is just the necessity of being like a jack of all trades as an astrologer and of having to get training in a bunch of different fields, even if you you don't become an expert in that specific thing or in that specific subfield, um, you need to expose yourself to it a little bit and at least get some basic familiarity with some of the, the key things and counseling skills or consulting skills is, is part of that. So to whatever extent you can try to educate yourself a little bit about that, try to read some books, try to take some training or a seminar or something on it that's going to be advantageous to you as an astrologer because there may be things that you know that you need to incorporate into your client work that you wouldn't know otherwise. Mm -hmm. And even if you don't even conceptualize yourself or if you got into astrology to be like a badass predictive astrologer or something crazy like something like that, mm. um, and you're like, I'm not a psychologist. Um, well, if you're you know, sitting down with people you know, for 75 minute consultations and you're talking about their intimate details of their private life, helping them to make major decisions and helping them to process events that are going on. Uh, you know, congratulations, you're now <laughs> at least uh, partially to some extent like um, dealing with some of that or mm -hmm. some of the same issues that psychologists deal with. Mm -hmm. uh, and you therefore need to have at least some passing familiarity with some of the areas that you need to be careful about and um, sensitive to. Mm -hmm, definitely. Yeah. All right. So did we answer that relatively decently? Yeah, I think so. I mean, we need to get into all the specifics of what you, yeah, what you would do, but I think that, yeah. Okay, cool. That does remind me of another one. I don't know if you want to jump to that one or not. What is um, that? The one about, let me find it real quick. Um... Here, um, it was the one about being happy for people when they're doing important things during bad weather, and then how do you not be fearful? There were two kind of connected. Okay. Do you want to do those? Um, as long as is it the segue the same, or is it sufficiently different? If you want to read one, go sure. Ahead. So the first one is: I have so many friends having babies and getting married in this atrocious astro weather this year. How do you as an astrologer handle knowing how bad it is while still trying to be happy for and supportive of people in these types of situations? And then the second that seemed a little similar to me was, how do you go from cowering in fear to not doing that? And I assume that meant, you know, seeing potentially scary, look scary looking timing coming up for yourself or other people, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and this does tie in nicely to his last one um, mm -hmm. because I don't know, I don't have a good answer to that because personally I still struggle with seeing difficult, really difficult transits and like constellations of time lord periods and transits like coming together in the future and then not uh, being on some level somewhat apprehensive at the very least about that coming up. Mm -hmm. And I've never fully found a way around that. And it's almost built into astrology to some extent itself. And I've been struggling with that for the past few years, like trying to figure out I mean, there's still a level where every time that happens and then I get to like the event itself, oftentimes it's more manageable or it makes mm -hmm. sense or it's terrible, but it's like life goes on. Yeah. And so there was certainly a level where 
just focusing on that and being like fearful of something that's coming up wasn't necessarily productive. And I don't think that's the point of astrology, but it's definitely mm-hmm. one of the potential pitfalls that as an astrologer, it becomes a lifelong thing to work through and not give into too much. But it's not something I don't think that comes easy or, you know, unless that's mm-hmm. just something I'm predisposed to myself. I know there's other astrologers especially with things like the magical tradition and the revival of astrological magic in the past few years that's come out of nowhere where they put their energy towards that, towards like trying to be mm-hmm. offsetting things ahead of time in hopes or in the belief that they can change like the influence of the planets or something like that so that maybe that sense of having some control or influence of it over it um, gives them a greater sense of um, of something. Mm-hmm. Like of agency. Right. Um, Yeah, I mean, I think there's always some element, I agree, that if you know astrology, then you can see potentials for hard things as well as positive things coming up before they happen. And that's kind of one of the weird things that people get excited about in in getting into astrology is you can see things ahead of time, right? Um, That's one of the main things that people get into it for. So I think like one piece of my response would be that you should know that that's always a pitfall, always a potential pitfall, and you should have things that make it much more valuable to you um, that are better, that outweigh that, basically. Um, Like what? I mean, being able to kind of have a sense of the contours of your upcoming life, I think, can be valuable, even if a piece of that naturally is some of the harder things as well as the good things. Um, I think also... You need to you need to not hyper focus on the negative things because I think yeah. and especially when people are earlier in astrology, I think um, you tend to do that. You tend to kind of zone in on like, oh my god, that looks terrible, and miss like everything else, which can be like eighty percent of the other stuff. Yeah, I had somebody do that that was like a student earlier this year, and they were like so convinced that like terrible things were going to happen to certain family members due to certain placements that they decided to quit astrology altogether. And I mm. thought that was a bit extreme. Yeah. Um, and that is a tendency for some early students. Like having it's that cliche about like having a little bit of knowledge um being dangerous. Mm-hmm, for sure. And I think, you know, um being involved with astrology longer, similar to just being alive longer, you kind of see um things come and go and it that most of the time things aren't usually worst case scenario. That worst case scenarios certainly can happen, but they don't happen most of the time. Yeah. You know. I mean, that's the biggest thing I think with most transits that eventually does help is realizing because that's the scariest part is once you do know the worst case scenarios for certain placements, you can have this tendency to assume it's going to be the worst case scenario. But oftentimes mm-hmm. when you get to the appointed date, it's much more mild and much more manageable and st- may still be, you know, uh rough or mm-hmm. or um irritable or or traumatic even, but um, is not as bad as it could be most of the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I remember there once there was something going on that I was concerned about with the third with my third house, and I mean uh, I was worried about something happening to my sister. Well, instead my laptop died. Right, so I was like, well, that's fine. Whereas you know, if I hadn't known any of the astrology, I might have been more annoyed that my laptop died. But in this case, I was like, oh, well, at least my sister's fine. You know, and they were both kind of fitting into third house significations. Um, you know, the communication aspect of using the computer and siblings going in the third house. So I think that's an example of another piece of what would be my reply is you need to also remember the scope of possible manifestations and that it's not necessarily just going to be this one thing you're worried about. Mm. Yeah. So um, continually pushing yourself not to jump to extreme conclusions and realizing which sometimes only comes through repeated experiences of this, that things tend to be more mild than they are. Mm-hmm. Even that, we we mentioned stoicism in passing and kind of joked about it, but I have found that to be useful philosophically, even if you don't ent- adopt it entirely, um, to incorporate elements of that philosophy into your astrological practice in terms of um, adopting a um, even keel no matter whether it's like a positive events that are happening in your life or or you know very negative events um but instead viewing them through the lens of seeing it um in the context of 
uh, indicating greater sense of meaning and purpose in your life, the fact that the astrology is working at all and that it's describing these events in your life mm -hmm. and there being something that's more comforting about that rather mm -hmm. than something that is just like oppressive and, and negative and depressing about that. Yeah, definitely. That was something I was kind of half thinking about that question as well, which is, you know, that to be able to see the landscape of people's lives, your life, other people around you, even future things um, has to be more of a positive than a negative for you to continue with astrology or else you're just going to, you know, drive yourself crazy if it's not. Um, I mean, what is the positive? I mean, because that is a thing sometimes bothers me about modern discussions is this assumption that it is necessarily positive. Um, like it could be negative. There could be negative things or or side effects or mm. you know um, that it's inherently positive to be involved with astrology. Do you mean, or that astrology itself is inherently positive? I mean, yeah. I mean, we're, I guess we're talking about one of the potential negative side effects mm -hmm. in and of itself, which is people not being able to handle too much information or right. not being able to handle foreknowledge about certain things in their life mm -hmm. or it causing certain personality types to worry excessively mm -hmm. and, and not being helpful in any way but instead somehow detracting from their mental state. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's it's just a counter to one of the things or like a truism that sometimes comes up in modern astrology, especially in like mid 20th century like new age and late 20th century new age astrology was the idea that like you know everybody's going to accept astrology sometime soon and it's going to lead to the dawning of the age of aquarius mm -hmm. and you know world peace is going to happen and it's going to be this amazing thing right when you know maybe astrology is not for everybody and maybe there are um certain things that could be like a drawback to that sure yeah I mean, but I think enough people, most people who are involved with astrology do find more positives than negative in it. And I think for me, I mean, if I were thinking about that question, because I do worry sometimes, you know, I can't say I'm immune to it, but um, to me, just the fact that it works at all, the fact that you can see these symbols that are like planets in the sky doing different things and they somehow symbolize what's going on in your life and sometimes to startlingly small detail, mm -hmm. you know, that's actually something to kind of be in awe about. Um, and to me, that's the greater positive, just kind of watching it work at all. Well, okay, well, let's talk about that <laughs> then because we used to disagree about this because to me, the fact that astrology works at all often, I used to take as an Im implication that there was some sort of sense of like meaning and purpose in the cosmos. Mm -hmm or maybe even some sort of broader meaning about, uh, I don't know, like if like deity is the right word, I don't remember how I framed like it. Like that there's a plan or something. Yeah, that maybe yeah. there's a plan for people, especially individuals' lives, but as, as well as like collectively like larger events or even sometimes very small minor events. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and to me that, that was often the implication of that, but you often disagreed years ago and said, why would you come to that conclusion? Or that's not necessarily a conclusion that you have to come to. If astrology works, it could mean something else. Have, mm -hmm. you, have you come around on that? Yeah, I've come around in a lot of ways, I think. Um, yeah, and I think it's funny, actually, that, you know, it, this kind of idea is so accepted in other subcultures, religion, different things like that, but it's just put in different words. I was thinking about that recently, you know, how people get excited about the idea of a destiny or, you know, in many religions, it's like God has a plan for you or this is God, God's will or not, you know, that, this kind of thing. But when we get into astrology, then it becomes like a weirder thing. Well, yeah, your point was that people like the idea of destiny, like meeting your soulmate, like it's mm -hmm. your destiny to some ultimate end point. Um, for destiny and it often being framed as a positive thing, but right. that when people start using the term fate, um, it's often cast in a negative or oppressive sense. Right. And I think fate is actually more of a neutral word, but people often take the connotation that it's more negative. Yeah. I mean, they're kind of interchangeable to some extent, except yeah. with destiny, it often has more of an implication of like an end point. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, which is given positive connotations. But yeah. astrology, one of the implications, one of the things that's tied into is the idea that there is some notion of fate, um, which you could also tie into some notion of predetermination, but then that hits the other end of the spectrum, which is a much more negative connotation of mm. if things are predetermined, then people take that to mean that our actions don't mean anything if they're not completely free and therefore or not 
you know, somehow anticipated ahead of time and therefore our lives are, are less meaningful for some reason. Right. And I think it's often about like what gives things meaning. Is it that you got to freely choose? Is it about the choice that makes things meaningful? Or is it the content itself of what you're doing in your life? Is it the actions, you know, or the experiences? Right. Um, and I think that's often an unquestioned piece. And certainly it was a piece of what I thought was inherently negative about that idea, you know, years back. Um, I've kind of come around a bit on that. But you know, in any case, no matter where you fall on the fate free will deter you know, fate free will spectrum, um, or what proportion of which, it, astrology itself, as I know you've said many times as well, astrology itself um, shows at least some piece of fate in this, mm -hmm. because these certain, even if you just look at transits, like they're going to happen in these certain areas of your life at very predetermined times, and that is all set up by the time you're born. You know, like your next hundred years. It's all set up. So, I mean, you know, what, whatever you do with that, you can still kind of fall on different degrees of fadedness, but it does imply at least some measure of that. So you kind of have to think that that's, there's some part of that that's positive or else I don't think astrology is maybe good for you. Yeah, I mean, the fate encompasses both positive and negative things. Right, exactly. That's, that's the biggest thing. It means, you know, um, that yeah, you're probably you're fated to meet that person at this certain point in your life, and that becomes the love of your life if that's part of your fate. And sometimes, you know, I have client charts in my book, Hellenistic Astrology, where it's like there was this couple and they met when they were 18, they both had Venus in the seventh house and a night chart, and mm -hmm. that was like the most positive part of their chart. And then they were married for like 60 or 70 years, right? And they met at that point in their life. Yeah. Um, so it's like there's those positive things that might be fated. And that's people sometimes spin as like one's destiny or something like that, mm -hmm. um, which to me is just interchangeable with one's fate. But then there's also those negative things like that person might, um, that was the love of your life, might die tragically or something due to, due to some incident at mm -hmm. a certain point in time. And that's tied in somehow with the f fate as well. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that, you know, people rarely mind the good parts, they don't mind good fatedness. So, right. Um, um, so I don't know. That's again for me, at least in the past, that's more where some of the stoicism has come into play in terms of understanding that all of it, if it works, is tied into some greater like matrix of like meaning and purpose. Even mm -hmm. sometimes the bad events, um, setting up things later and being part of a sequence of events, which is really what the term fate means, um, like a sequence or a series of events that is. Um, interconnected and is arranged in a specific order so that certain things happen um, when they're supposed to happen, mm -hmm. uh, that it's all sort of necessary and that good good things can come out of positive things and bad things out of and vice versa. Right, for sure. I mean, I really agree because I know as someone who I personally was not, I was interested in religion as a topic, but not apt to be very like faith-based in terms of just taking things at faith, like you're supposed to believe this is the way the world works. So in mm -hmm. that sense, when I got into astrology, this was actually kind of a revelation of like, okay, this is something that I can actually see working and therefore it is some proof that there's some sort of plan going on. You know, you don't know the de details behind that necessarily. But so I think that you have to think that that's a good piece. I think another piece of the um, not cowering in fear is you know, you shouldn't, you know, if you're not already decided that everything is faded, there is a way in which seeing things ahead of time can be very beneficial as well because you can then try to work with it. I mean, many people do think of it that way, you know, especially in modern astrology. I think I see this transit come up, coming up and I want to know about that transit ahead of time so that I can work with it to the best of my ability. And, you know, some things maybe will definitely happen no matter what, but I think that's I, I still feel that way in terms of internal reactions, because upcoming movements in astrology can correlate with you feeling a certain way as well. And so even if whether or not you can change events that are related to those things, I think you can to some degree work with it internally. You know, I mean, some will be harder than others, obviously, but mm -hmm. you know, you can go, oh, I'm apt to feel really impatient right now. It's good for me to know that so that I can try to like you know, mitigate that to the best of my ability. Mm -hmm. Doesn't necessarily change everything in the world, but I think that's still a useful application as well. That you know, in terms of looking ahead. Yeah, 
and I mean, so internally you have some control over things, even though you you might have certain predispositions internally, even, mm -hmm. um, but also externally, um, in terms of there's going to be different types of events, and some of them are going to be more negotiable, and some of them are not. In right. terms of um, if it's a surmountable issue that you just need to like put effort into it, and then you'll overcome. Like mm -hmm. let's say you're having a Saturn transit in a day chart, and Saturn's relatively well placed in your chart, and it's like an area of struggle. But then, through much effort and and um, you know sacrifice or what have you, you eventually are able to overcome the difficulty and become stronger as a result of it. Mm -hmm. It's like that is a class of possible outcomes for certain placements, and then there's like another class of outcomes which are just like no matter how hard you try, you you can't proceed further in that area, or you're just sort of shut down or said no to in that area of your life, mm -hmm. um, regardless of how badly you want it. And sometimes figuring out which of those two, though, is tricky, and you don't always know, even if there are markers for which way it should go astrologically in some instances. Mm -hmm. Right. And I mean, that's something to draw out, draw out explicitly as well, is that even if you think there's the idea of some things being faded, it's not necessarily so that everything is the same amount of faded you know right it's another possibility and so that would be another reason to look ahead okay so maybe that i mean maybe that's it and that's something i've come to a lot is just maybe free will lies in the astrologer's inability to say for certain exactly what will take place in the future mm -hmm. um, and in that there is a certain amount of freedom and there may still be guidelines there you may still know the general scope or range of things but your inability to ever fully know um, precisely in detail, because we're not looking at like a crystal ball here that shows like a movie of exactly what's going to happen in the future. We're looking at a set of symbols, um, sometimes complex and sometimes very specific overlapping symbolism, but symbolism nonetheless that has to be interpreted and could mean different things. Mm -hmm. And in that, a person should always have a certain amount of reservation about getting too hung up on knowing for sure that this exact outcome is definitely going to be the case. Mm -hmm. And there's yeah. some freedom in that. I agree. Okay. Did we answer mm. that question or the first, second one at I least? I think we answered the second one. A lot of that touched on things involving the first one, um, although I did want to address something specifically about that. About um, having friends that are having babies or getting married mm -hmm. in the atrocious astrological weather. I mean, we used an analogy in the forecast episode about this where Kelly used like a hurricane analogy. Mm. And I sort of expanded that and said, you know, sometimes a hurricane will hit like a neighborhood and like the entire neighborhood will be flattened, but there'll be like that one house that's just standing there with just mm -hmm. like a few scratches on it, but right. not. And sometimes I kind of relate that to. You know, there can be bad weather astrologically, like right now with the Mars retrograde square Saturn and Mercury is about to go retrograde opposite Uranus and just all sorts of crazy stuff going on. Mm -hmm. But um, for some people, that's hitting their chart in a certain way, their their natal chart, where like Jupiter's like trining all their stuff right now and none of their difficult placements are getting hit as badly. Mm -hmm. So while they may be, um, you know, there's a certain level where you know all boats sort of rise in high tide, or like whatever the the mean, whatever the phrase is. Mm -hmm. There's some um, individual people that are going to fare better, even in what is uh, difficult astrological weather for the masses. Mm -hmm, definitely, yeah, I think that's a really good point. And also in terms of people getting married or something like that, I always think about. You know, you only that's the general weather that you're seeing with like the transits that are going on for the macrocosm. Mm -hmm. And it will hit everyone's chart in some place. But in addition to it hits, hitting some of them in more acute places than others or, or more obscure, um, in contrast, everyone has their own timing going on. So I'm thinking like I look at someone's zodiacal releasing for a lot of arrows for relationships. Maybe this is like the best time of their life, you know, for relationships. And so they did indeed just meet someone and they want to get married and it's actually going to be great for them. So it's not only the ongoing transits that have something to say about the experience. And I think that's important to remember in not assuming that this would necessarily be terrible for your friends um, or whoever you're thinking about. So there's always everyone's individual timing going on in addition to the um, macrocosmic weather and there's always multiple factors going on. So that's just one piece. Yeah. So uh, it's tricky because the part of the answer is just like you, you shouldn't be too 
judgmental or too judge, judge jumping to conclusions. Certainly, if somebody initiates something right now, it's going to build in some of the quality of this moment in a way that's challenging or potentially difficult in some sector of their chart, mm -hmm. whether it's a birth chart or whether it's an electional chart for like a wedding or something like that. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, that may not be something that's fully structurally wrong if it's not like placed in a certain way that's prominent in the chart. Mm -hmm. It may be something that's relegated to some relatively minor area of the life or that comes up in the future that's like a hassle but is not a complete deal breaker necessarily. And it may not um, you know, mean that that thing shouldn't have happened during that time. That's one of the things we struggle with as electional astrologers and struggle mm -hmm. with is just have to be reminded of and that we were reminded of this month is just sometimes you have to do things and you can't just put your life on hold mm -hmm. if everything's not you know, optimal. Right, and I think that also gets to the more core issue that um, is fundamental to astrology, which is, you know, are you trying to maximize all of the time the best things in life? Or are you, do you understand that sometimes things can be hard, but it's still meaningful? But still worth it. Yeah, still do. worth it or still meaningful in some way. Or even if they're things that befall you and you're not happy about them, can there be something meaningful about that? And I, I certainly don't glorify suffering, but, you know, there can still be meaning in things that are hard. So, and things that you can't avoid. And mm -hmm. there are always things you can't avoid. You can't maximize everything. Right. So, um, I think that's the other important piece of this is like not to get, uh, and I'm definitely speaking to myself here as well, you know, because I would have some of the same thoughts if I heard someone was about to get married and it was terrible weather, you know, especially doing electional astrology. But, um, you know, maybe someone gets married and maybe they're married for eight years and it's a hard relationship, but then they have a child out of it and that was actually the ultimate purpose or they learn something important about what not to do in relationships and then they have like a very happy second marriage or, you know, there's so many things like that. Mm. So I'm not saying run full force towards the hardest things, but um, just remember that you can't control everything in life through astrology. So you're predicting anybody that gets married right now will be <laughs> no. divorced in eight years? No, I'm not. <laughs> I just want to make sure you're clear for the record. <laughs> no, I'm definitely not. I'm I'm speaking to different possibilities. The okay. first one that I spoke of with the Zodiaco releasing <laughs> was that you know someone gets married and lives very happily for the next several decades together. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Uh, there's just different things in the natal chart or in the Zodiac release. The time lord periods that can be overriding factors, and mm -hmm. sometimes that can be sufficient to override it and make that period great for them versus everyone else, which I've brought up on the forecast, but just reminds me of like how, you know, there's so much um difficulty and like suffering this year. Mm -hmm. If you're just thinking of like the masses and, and large groups of people um having died, for example, in the US uh due to COVID. But then it's like there's whatever wealthy investors that have become like more rich this year because they, mm -hmm. you know, whoever the genius was that wasn't me, I wish it was because I've been using it for several years, who's been using like Zoom, for example. <laughs> yeah. Like I remember we've been using that for like five years now because mm -hmm. it was referred to me, I think, at a Norwalk by like Kira Sutherland, the astrologer. Oh, really? Yeah. Mm. And that was like five years ago. So I've been using it since then. As an alternative to Skype, and then all of a sudden now everyone's using Zoom this year, and the stock mm -hmm. is like shot up. Yeah. So occasionally, it's people that um, do very well, uh, not just despite negative circumstances, but also, but sometimes um, as a result of negative right. circumstances. And that's actually a talk that I'm developing for the Northwest Astrology Conference next May is going to mm -hmm. be on malefics because there's this recurring statement in some of the Hellenistic texts that. In Antiochus of Athens, he says that um, Saturn, when it's well placed in a chart, signifies benefits to the native that occur as a result of at the detriment of other people or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was a really interesting perspective on what it means for a malefic to be well placed in a chart. And it's something I've been exploring for the past few years and want to go through and explore with more example charts, like the way that malefics can sometimes be beneficial in this highly specific way and how you could identify a scenario in a chart where something's like good for you even if it's not good for somebody else. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Okay. So did we at all answer that question um, sufficiently? I, th I think so. Yeah. Okay. I mean, and in terms of the having babies, I mean, that's talking about whole new birth charts, right? Like, I think that that get really gets into fadedness for me. Like, yeah. how many people are just 
for whatever reason, fated to be born with certain things in their charts. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, it kind of reminds me, there's a one friend of ours earlier this year who, who was born with like a Saturn-Pluto conjunction and then like interestingly had a baby with a Saturn-Pluto oh, yeah. conjunction at the same time. And then mm -hmm. like, obviously there's been a lot of like chaos this year surrounding that, but it's interesting seeing some of those chart signatures passed down from generation to generation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe that happening in a certain context with what's going on in society. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, that it doesn't always necessarily have to be like terrible for the native themselves. Right. Yeah. Yep. All right. So let's move on to some other questions. Okay. What would you like to talk about next? Um, uh, yeah, there was a lot of sect questions. I think you mm. wanted to answer some of those, right? Yeah, there were several. And so I thought that we should at least just touch on that. Um, there were several questions regarding, let me find them here. Do you have them in front of you? Yeah, one of them. Oh, here. Um, I'd, love to, I'd love to hear y'all talk about charts with the sun near the horizon and best ways to determine whether the chart operates as a day or night chart. I keep seeing these in my practice and I'm curious how others handle them. And that was from on Twitter from at Corporeal Cancer. Mm -hmm. And then there were two others that were very similar. Right. So at Lunar Gemini on Twitter says, I'd love to hear your take on sect and sunrise slash sunset charts. And um, Katie Dayton on Facebook says, I saw some others mention this on Twitter, but I thought I'd drop in here two Strategies for determining night slash day sect when somebody is born very close to dawn or dusk. Mm -hmm. um, so the short version of this is like most people will say it becomes a day chart as soon as the sun hits the degree of the ascendant, mm -hmm. um, wherever the degree of the ascendant is because that's the horizon. And as soon as the sun hits the ascendant, it sort of breaks the horizon and moves upwards above the ascendant and, and the body of the sun becomes visible. And then it's definitely a day chart mm -hmm. versus it becomes a night chart when the sun in the evening hits the degree of the descendant and then moves fully below it. Mm -hmm. um, because once it moves fully below it, the body of the sun sets under the western horizon. Mm -hmm. um, but the history in that is at some point five or six years ago, and you can probably listen back to this in certain episodes of the podcast when I started working on it, but I think it started with the chart of George Lucas where I started noticing some charts with the sun just barely below the horizon, especially when it was near the degree of the ascendant that were behaving like day charts, even though the sun technically hadn't risen over the horizon or over the degree of the ascendant yet. Mm -hmm. And there were some of them, his was the most extreme case because I think it was, at least, it was like five degrees off, five degrees below the degree of the ascendant, but getting ready to rise basically in the morning. And it still seemed like it was behaving like a day chart, and especially the zodiac releasing periods were working better when I used the day, day chart calculation for the lot of spirit. So there's different complications and arguments surrounding that, but the conclusion I ended up coming to was there was a range of several degrees where if the sun was within that range, what happens is if you go out in the morning and you, every astrologer should do this, they should go out like wake up early someday, which is harder for some like myself who are not morning people, but wake up super early, take an astrology app either on your phone or take your laptop outside about, let's say, 30 minutes or an hour before sunrise and just like sit out there for an hour or two during the course of sunrise and look at the chart and keep animating or refreshing the chart every five minutes or so and see what it looks like outside just visually in terms of how bright it is as the sun is at different spots. Mm -hmm. And what happens is you'll notice that once the sun gets within five or six degrees of the ascendant, um, getting ready to rise from underneath the horizon, um, it gets really bright out, even if the sun hasn't broken the horizon yet. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why some charts in my experience start acting like day charts even if the sun isn't fully at the ascendant yet. Right. So I usually use a range of like, I don't know, five, six degrees tops right now typically for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember there was some like really early flight we had to go on before we started deliberately choosing to avoid those, mm -hmm. to, like a conference or something. And we were sitting on a parking lot outside of like a breakfast place near the airport watching the sun come up. And we're like, 
okay, how many degrees is it? Look how bright it is out here, you know? Right. Um, so yeah, I mean, in practice, and I feel a lot more comfortable with this now since I've worked with many more people over the past several years um, yeah. with um, kind of questionable day, night chart um, status. And I think it's about similar, you know, it's within five or six degrees, but I always test it within yeah. that range. Right. And the, I think a couple other things are important to note. First, you can't have a no sect chart. You can't be in between. Mm. So, I mean, I think this is something that sometimes people raise because it sometimes is- Sometimes they think it's both or something. Yeah, or that they have some special liminal status. But I mean, and that, I can understand that just from a common sense perspective, because it does seem kind of liminal, but in practice, it always does act more like a day chart or a night chart. And we can talk in a minute about like how you might test that. Mm -hmm. But um, so that's important to note. The second thing I've noticed a lot, and I think you've mentioned this as well, is um, the ascendant side seems to have more of a range yeah. below the ascendant. When you get to the descendant, it switches much more quickly. Yeah, it's like the range <clears throat> definitely on the ascendant side, like two to three degrees, like it's definitely typically acting like a day chart mm -hmm. if it's within two to three degrees below. And sometimes the range can extend up to like five or six degrees in mm -hmm. some instances. Yeah. So the range is, is considerably somewhat wide. Um, but then on the descendant, when the sun has set below the horizon, for some reason the range seems to be tighter and it's more like like up to three degrees or maybe two to three degrees. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally agree. And I'll always test it on either side, but that's just another important detail to note as well that there there is a wider range on the on the ascendant side. So yeah, that reminds me to look up a chart that I meant to check that relates to the epigon. Mm, okay. Um, so in terms of testing it, um, because I think you know, that's the first thing to know is just what is the kind of possible range where it could go one way or the other, mm. um, or it could, you know, be technically look like a night chart, but it's actually a day chart with the sun rising. Um, that's the first piece. The second is how do you test that? Because you should always test it with the person to confirm whether it's acting like a day or a night chart. That's the second piece. Um, and I primarily do that. You, you need to kind of be comfortable with the benefics and malefics. Um, so basically, Jupiter will always be the most positive placement, all other factors being equal in a day chart, Venus conversely in a night chart. And then Mars will always be the most challenging placement in a in a day chart. Again, all the other factors being equal. There are some, you know, mitigations that can change this, which is troublesome if you're trying to, you know, check out the sect. But and then Saturn is the more challenging one for night charts. So you want to ask questions of the client if this is a client or of yourself if it's your chart. Um, particularly in terms of the houses those four are placed in and which area between the Venus and the Jupiter placement the person has typically had the best experiences with and conversely you know the hardest experiences with Mars versus Saturn and then you also want to look at the houses that each of those rules um, and usually if you keep asking questions about all of those possibilities where the houses that those are placed in and rule you get some sense of which it seems to be yeah, definitely. I mean, then that's one of our main rules for chart rectification, mm -hmm. <clears throat> especially deciding between one rising sign or another. If you just have two options, is looking at where the most positive planet and what the most negative planet is by house placement um, in those two different charts. And that's like a quick and easy way because it's such a reliable thing typically that mm -hmm. if you have a day chart, the most positive planet is Jupiter and the most challenging planet is Mars. If you have a night chart, the most positive planet is Venus, and the most challenging planet is Saturn, and you can get a lot of mileage just out of that basic distinction. Mm -hmm. And I mean, do keep an eye out though for like major mitigations. Like for instance, if someone has a uh, probable night chart, but like Saturn is exalted in Libra and you know enclosed by Venus and Jupiter, like okay, that's not going to be that hard, and so you're going to have to investigate other areas. Yeah, that was a major thing that you found, especially in your Saturn return. Well, I had found, and you had also found, mm -hmm. and we talked about in some of their Saturn return work that people, it's very relevant for people now, that people with night charts tended to have typically more challenging Saturn returns. Um, but one of the major mitigating factors is if a planet had a uh, zodiacal dignity, if Saturn was well placed by sign. Mm -hmm. Either being in its one of its domiciles in Capricorn or Aquarius, or being in the sign of its exaltation, which is Libra, and mm -hmm. those cases would often come off as not like the worst case scenario, even if it was a challenging transit. Mm -hmm. Those or having like close aspects with the benefics, or having reception with its ruler, and 
things like that can definitely offset what you're looking at. But by and large, you can, you know, that's going to be an outlier anyway, that someone's malefic contrary to sect is like hugely mitigated. So, you know, you can use these four and kind of start narrowing it down. It, it is very dependent on the person's kind of self-assessment of their own life. So there can be- Which is always completely <laughs> objective. Right. So there can be issues still, you know, because yeah, we've talked about that before actually. But um, you can, most most of the time, you can figure it out. Yeah, you can. A, pers a person can. A person can. <laughs> and yeah. Uh, yeah, that's one of my, that's always one of my favorite things about doing astrology with client stuff is sometimes just people having a hard time looking at their life objectively and taking certain things for granted, both mm -hmm. negative things sometimes they would take for granted as well as sometimes positive things and right. universalizing those experiences and just assuming it's the same for everybody. Right. So unfortunately, that may be an issue that you run into is blind spots that you have if you're trying to rectify your chart using this technique because you might not recognize how that area of your life has actually been more positive than it is for most people, or that mm. area of your life has been more challenging than it is for most people. So in some instances, like uh, you might want to like call a lifeline. I don't, is a, no, who's I a don't. millionaire, like call, <laughs> call outs, are those still relevant in 2020? I'm not sure it is. No, you've never seen that show? Okay, so it's definitely not relevant. So whatever the 2020 reference is to, um, you know, phoning a friend mm -hmm. to, get some objective advice, like another astrology of friend mm -hmm. that might be helpful in evaluating your life and evaluating the, some of those placements to see which ones are more, working more positively or negatively. There are, yeah, there's so many benefits, I think, to talking through some of this with another person because they can not only ask questions that you might not think of, um, but they might also hear you touch on something that's important that you might not have like noticed yourself. And this will happen actually if you do try to talk through these placements with someone to try to figure out whether it's a day or night chart or in rectification. Right. Um, you know, I've had that experience where, you know, I'm trying to figure out if someone's eighth house ruled by Jupiter is like one of their best areas. And they're like, no, nothing really. And then like sometime later on in the conversation, they'll be like, oh, but I did inherit five houses once. You yeah, know, like, like, <laughs> you know my, grand, my grandmother died and, and left me $100,000, but that was, you know, just a thing. Right, exactly. That, that happens right. <laughs> as one, one does. Right. Or inherit, I mean, yeah, I've had that happen with inheriting houses and things. It's like, okay, well, not everyone inherits houses. <laughs> so that's important. <laughs> right. Like Lisa Marie Presley is my my example for that mm -hmm. with right. Jupiter and like uh, the day chart in the second house and the ruler of the second and the eighth and ruler of the eighth and the second and all of that happened. I feel like she would she would have noticed that that was like inheritance was a positive thing. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> she wouldn't have taken that for granted. <laughs> well, because it's such an outlier. Like $25 million or something in Elvis's estate the day she turned 25. Right. And the problem is usually for most everyday people, it's going to be more measured than that, even if it is still like one of their most positive areas. So okay. like like you were just saying, like inheriting 100,000. Well, you know, maybe that doesn't seem like a big deal to someone, but, you know, it's more than, you know, some people don't inherit anything. So. It was funny because there's a there's a review of my book once that was a negative. It was one of the few negative reviews of my book. And one of the chart examples, he criticized one of the chart examples, which was Lisa Marie Presley. And he's like, well, he used an example where this person turned 25 and they went into a second house perfection year and they inherited $25 million. But um, you know, everyone doesn't do that. And everybody has a second house perfection year at the age of, you know, okay. 25. Mm -hmm. But the what they didn't evidently understand about that entire chapter of the book was the whole premise was it depends on how your natal chart is set up and mm -hmm. if you have certain placements that show a predisposition for that right. then at that time at certain ages those are going to be the opportunities where the potential or the natal promise can be unlocked mm -hmm. and, and sort of awakened but if you don't have those placements then you know that's going to come and go and may not be a big thing for you mm -hmm. uh, it's sort of an integral whole piece of that how that system works i feel like this is actually something that comes up a lot um people sort of negating or s sort of blowing off one particular rule of astrology of traditional ast astrology in particular because it doesn't work in isolation like mm -hmm. it seems like this has come up with benefics and malefics it's come up with good and bad houses it's come up with perfection like it's come up with every single piece that i've seen actually um because it's always necessary to combine them all together and they all kind of um alter each other's function and you have to be able to synthesize all those rules yeah i mean that's one of the reasons despite everyone's protest and saying i should break it up i wanted to put everything in my book 
so that you had an overview of the entire system because I feel like it's only once you have an overview of the entire system and all of those different pieces and see how they work together that you can really assess um, the system that was ancient astrology, especially Hellenistic astrology, which was the you know um, the the central core and the starting point of all subsequent traditions of Western astrology. Mm-hmm. You've got to see the whole system laid out in front of you, and if you only have like parts of it, it's kind of hard to uh, to assess. It's hard to assess, and it's also easier to dismiss. Like this doesn't work because this example, right? Which is yeah. what that person I was citing did. They were right. like, "Well, perfections doesn't work because everybody gets that at twenty five. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that actually reminds me of the one of the other questions here. I don't know if you want to go into that one next. Sure. It was the um, about the houses, about the 6th, 8th, 12th houses. Did we answer the other one sufficiently? Like just there's the, a, a range. It's probably like five to six degrees by the ascendant, mm-hmm. two to three degrees, give or take, by the descendant. Yeah. Still some research needs to be done there, but it does seem tighter. Mm-hmm. And that it's going to be one or the other. And, and unfortunately, if you're in that range, you're going to have to rectify the chart basically, especially mm-hmm. using the benefics and malefics and sect. And not just the natal placements, because sometimes that can be kind of subjective, but also look at the transits, mm-hmm. like whole sign transits through certain houses, like Saturn transits that last two or three years through the whole sign houses and mm-hmm. see if that was like, you know, constructive slow buildings, minor setback, but ultimate um success, or was this like major hurdles that you ran into and, and blockages that you couldn't surmount, yeah. in, insurmountable difficulties, um, versus if you were having that with certain Mars transits, like mm-hmm. especially a retrograde. Retrograde Mars periods are really great periods to know if you have a day chart, because mm-hmm. the people that have day charts sometimes are the ones that run into like major issues sometimes mm-hmm. in that area of their life of whatever house it's transiting through. Yeah, that's true. Although don't get derailed by, you know, sometimes it also being difficult for night chart people, which is not the same level of difficult in the end. Yeah. And that's where needing objective other astrologer to talk to can be really useful in mm-hmm. trying to get some objective feedback about that. Right. And on the flip side, um, this is actually like a pretty common truism that Jupiter transits are often disappointing for night chart people because they're actually not as amazing as people make them out to be. Right. Um, and maybe one little good thing will happen, but it's not like people are just like, oh, really? That's supposed to be Jupiter transit that nothing happened. Versus day chart people, they usually do have something notable that happened if you draw their memory. Yeah. And the night chart people get the more positive Venus transits and especially like Venus retrogrades, mm-hmm. which last for like 40 days, even though it seems shorter than like a Jupiter transit and people feel like they didn't win out in that equation, um, it still actually ends up balancing out. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I think that's good for a sect. Yeah. Uh, what was the next one you wanted to answer? So the difficult houses. Um, there were a few about this. Okay. One was um, Kelly Holder on Facebook said, can you talk about the domicile lord of the hour marker being in a difficult house? For example, Scorpio rising with Mars in the 12th. Um, Amelia Merrick said, also, what if both benefics are in domicile, etc., but in shitty places like the 6th or 8th? Like in tangible terms, how does that make them show up? Much better situations for the house they're in or just we- weaker benefics in general? And Carly Lynn on Facebook also said, how do exalted, dignified planets function in difficult houses, 12th, 6th, and 8th? And this has actually come up like a lot that I've seen. And I had actually mentioned it on Twitter recently because I had seen some discussions around this as well. With It's come up a lot for you in client charts? No, in discussion. I feel like a lot of people are asking about this lately. Of what to do with malefics when they're dignified and in bad houses or what? Um, just about placements in the so-called bad houses in general, and are they always, like, you know, are they always, do they always work out in a bad way, or are there better ways they can work out, and kind of like, what do you do with those so-called bad houses? Okay. All right. Take it away. Okay. Uh, You said you didn't feel as strongly about answering this one. Um, It's just a tricky question, and don't know if I have, like, final thoughts on this yet, because it's still mm -hmm. an area of further research as I bounce back and forth between and try to synthesize in my own practice the modern and ancient approaches with Mm -hmm. the modern approaches being like, there's good things that come out of every placement and you can Mm -hmm. make the most out of everything and everybody, you know, is just, there's, um, has different strengths and weaknesses or strengths in different areas and everything can be a strength, whereas the ancient Mm -hmm. approach is just like, no, there's some things that are just really difficult and, bad and problematic and and you can't 
get around that too much with some room for mitigations and things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I feel like in client charts as well, I've seen I've seen a big range and so much, and this is kind of touching back on what we were talking about a few minutes ago, so much depends on synthesizing all of the different pieces of assessing quality mm. because it does depend on whether it's a benefic or even the benefic of the sect or something in a bad house. You know, it does depend on whether there's mitigation. It does depend on if something in one of those houses is like exactly configured to the midheaven degree. Yeah, you know? that, that's huge. It's huge. Yeah. So there's still a big range and it doesn't have to be just like Pollyanna-ish thinking about a big range possibility. You know, there is qualitatively... Um, you know, and factually speaking, there is a big range of potential manifestations, and it depends a lot on these specifics. So I would say in terms of just things being placed, benefics, let's talk about the benefics first, benefics being placed in those houses. So benefics in difficult houses, especially yeah. the 6th, 8th, or 12th. Yes. Um, so I think, you know, the 6th, the 8th, and 12th, and to some degree, the 2nd are all considered more difficult houses because they don't have um, a whole sign aspect to the ascendant. Mm -hmm. And so that's considered kind of not as operative. And um, so that's one piece. They all though still have a range of things that are kind of harder. So they're, they're also, especially the sixth, eighth and 12th, they contain some of the objectively harder subjects in life. So for instance, the eighth contains like death and sometimes traumas. Um, the 12th con uh, contains suffering, um, sometimes mental um, health difficulties, sometimes long-lasting physical health difficulties, estrangement, you know, those, those fun topics. Right. Loss, self-undoing. Yeah. Um, and things where you're separated from society, so hospitals go there, prisons go there. Yeah. Isolation. Yeah. Isolation. And the sixth can be illness. That's probably one of the biggest, you know, um, problems with the six as well as subordination. So sometimes having more of a subordinate role than you would like in, in, you know, in life or in your work or things like that. So they objectively contain some of the harder topics of life. And I don't think one should, you know, blow that off because hard topics do exist in life mm -hmm. and they exist for some people more than others. Um, but those, those three houses also contain some positive topics. And so this is like I would say for the sixth, it can be um, hard work, like people who really embrace hard work. Right. Um, sixth can also be kind of, you know, if it's a better positioned sixth house can be gained through, you know, being the assistant to someone really important in the world or something like that. Also things involving like pets and animals, like um, that, that sounds kind of a blow off topic, but that's really important for some people. So I've seen like veterinarians or things like that in the mm. sixth house. Um, the eighth house, um, I've seen things like psychologists, psychotherapists can go there. Um, people who also work in other ways besides psychology with helping people through hard things. So it's not necessarily you going through the hard thing. Sometimes it is someone who has gone through something hard who then makes their life work out of helping other people with that. Right. Um, yeah. Like eighth, I've been thinking a lot lately about... Um, Sometimes, not always, but some manifestations of people with important like eighth and twelfth house placements can be um, learning empathy through loss or through suffering or having personal experience with that, um, creating a sense of empathy and understanding within the person, which then allows them to go out and um, help other people that are dealing with loss or, or tragedy in a way that's unique and that they never would have been able to do if they hadn't had some personal exposure experience to that themselves. Mm -hmm, definitely. Yeah, totally agree. Um, other eighth house positive topics, I've seen inheritance as we were just talking about. Um, inheritance, uh, like money from- like Money a, from other people. From other people in general. Yeah. And that, that seems like such a broad statement, but the specific ways in which that works out are just so there's so many different ways that mm -hmm. that can work out that are yeah. really entertaining to watch um, and interesting. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. I've seen people whose um, spouse makes a lot of money, for instance. Yeah, spouse or just like I've seen people where other people just like throw money at that person. Yeah. Like they go through life mm -hmm. um, going from like donor to donor or just like people like help wanting to help them out mm -hmm. um, either 
in some instances it's like the person is really good at like working other people and like extracting money from other people in mm -hmm. some other instances it's just like they're lucky and they continually find themselves at the right place at the right time mm -hmm. with like patrons or or just random people or relationships or whatever that Definitely. ends up being financially beneficial to them for some reason. Mm -hmm. I've seen people who like easily get investors for like little ideas they have and people are like, here, let me fund that for you. And then you can do the idea. Right. Um, yeah. So other people's money is like a real positive when there's positive stuff going on with the eighth house. Um, uh, similar to that, uh, people who work in banking or investments or things like that, they're working with other people's money. That can be, you know, a more like neutral way of the eighth house expressing. Yeah. Accountants. Mm -hmm. Accountants. Yeah, for sure. Accountants and banking, I've seen a lot with the 8th house. Um, the 12th house, you know, often it is, you know, the, the difficult topics appear in these houses. So sometimes it's more like, well, the, the topics that aren't difficult that fall in those houses, you get those. If you have the benefics there or ruling it. Sometimes it's simply that you still get the difficult topics, but you're benefiting it from, from it somehow rather than going through it yourself. Mm. So I've seen that a lot with the 12th house. Like, so people who work in or volunteer in prisons rather than them than themselves being imprisoned mm -hmm. um one of my favorite examples is like someone who has a benefic like the one benefic in the 12th and the benefic of sect ruling the 12th and they're a doctor and they have um hospital rounds and so they're getting benefit from the topic of hospital and ill health but they themselves are not experiencing that most of the time mm -hmm. So it can be, that's one of the ways in which benefics in those houses can, in or ruling those houses can work out. Yeah, that's one of my famous examples in my book of a uh, benefic ruler of the ascendant, like Jupiter ruling the ascendant in the 10th, and it was placed in the 6th in the day chart, and it was also bonafide by Venus. So did like multiple stacking positive things, mm -hmm. and the person was like a doctor, and then became the head of a hospital, and then became advocate for client or patient care and, and different things like that mm -hmm, exactly so it's still the topic of like ill health but you know it's something more positive that is expressing in that person's life around that topic mm -hmm. so um i think that's one of the major ways that the benefics can play out so those are kind of the two major ways i guess mm -hmm. yeah so either getting more of the benefits from the difficult topics while not experiencing it most of the time yourself, or um, the few topics that are the more positive ones that fall in those houses, respectively, you know, having more focus on those. Now, I mean, that said, most people's condition of most houses is going to be mixed, right, to some degree or another. Yeah, and also important distinction. Usually, when you're the one, when the native is themselves the one actively playing a role in that house and is able to become the agent, it's often when the ruler of the ascendant is the one in that house mm -hmm, true. versus if it's just like things happening that aren't necessarily the person taking it on themselves to do good things in that area, that's when it's just some other planet, like a benefic that's there that's not necessarily the ruler of the ascendant. True. And then it can manifest more related to whatever house that's ruling. Right. And the people sometimes associate with that house. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to mention one of the funny things about the 12th house that we keep continually seeing coming up in my chart is one of the issues of, um, it, it happens in the 12th house, it also happens to some extent in the 4th house, but things mm. that are hidden that are not mm -hmm. in the view of the native, right. and that might be like an 8th house thing as well, I'm not fully sure, I've heard people say that, but it hasn't come up as much, but definitely 12th house and 4th house things that aren't immediately known and aren't in the vantage point or hidden from the view of the native initially. Mm -hmm. um, and it can be like positive things that happen that affect your life that you don't realize, or it can be negative things that happen that affect your life that you don't know about mm -hmm. until later, if ever. Um, it can be important, like 12th and 4th house topics. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. And I that reminds me, actually, there's um, one more positive uh, signification of the 12th house that I didn't mention that I see come up a lot when um, Jupiter or Venus are, are related to the 12th, and that is sort of positive experiential metaphysical things. So, um, you know, the 12th as kind of like a mystical house is really more of a modern signif signification of that house topic. Um, but, and so I do see all of the difficult ones come up too, you know, in the 12th house. I would definitely not blow off that the 12th house contains lots of difficult topics. But um, when that when that signification comes out, to me, when I've seen that, it is usually when 
a benefic, and particularly a benefic of the sect, is placed in or ruling the twelfth house. And when that happens, I, I do set, see that really being a positive expression of the twelfth house for that person is people who are really involved with meditation or Reiki or um, sort of, you know, even yoga, if it's more of a contemplative type of yoga. So basically the experiential things that kind of blur boundaries of like you and the universe, um, I see being a positive thing. Um, even magic, um, I see sometimes come up with the 12th house and people with the positive 12th house. Mm -hmm. So it's not always that the 12th house means that, but I do see it happen sometimes when there's benefics involved. Okay. Yeah. And it's such a different, so much of the take, you know, the traditional take on the 12th house is largely like Saturnian. Mm -hmm. And then the modern take is largely Neptunian mm -hmm. with just like a couple crossovers, like Rhetorius calling the 12th the place, the house in between worlds, because the native is like, um, you know, in the process of being born and moving from uh, whatever is on the other side of life into life mm -hmm. at that time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, so, I mean, neither of them have to negate each other. Both do exist in the world. It's just a matter of the specifics of your 12th house. Right. Um, yeah. I also have been thinking a lot. I forget who mentioned this, but I'd been thinking about a lot of the past year, just the notion that in the 12th house, in addition, um, it's the house that ri rose. It was the sign that rose prior to the birth. So mm -hmm. it somehow indicates that which happens prior to birth. Mm -hmm. um, but also the notion that the stars, when they rise over the horizon, or um, once the sun rises over the horizon, all of the stars that previously were visible, um, when they rose before the sun, suddenly become invisible and like sort of disappear and get hidden mm -hmm. due to the sun's rays and due to the daylight sort of blocking everything out, and that potentially being part of where some of the like hidden sort of significations of the twelfth house come from. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, but that just thinks I mentioned on the forecast, but I should reiterate it here since the forecast will have a shorter shelf life and this will be around for a while. But one of my examples of that 12th house thing was um, the Mars retrograde, having transiting Mars go through my third house, a so short distance travel, and then squaring the ruler of my third house, which is in my 12th house. And literally on that day, like my car was towed and like taken to impound for like. The plates were expired or something like that just barely mm -hmm. but i didn't know about it because of the um uh you know the coronavirus and everything and not using the car as much we found out like a month later or three weeks later or something like that mm -hmm. and then laughed when we looked we were able to look up the exact chart for the exact moment when the car was impounded because the, it was written down electronically when they they took it in and that it was like the exact day that mars transiting mars squared uh, the ruler of my third house at that time. Mm -hmm. So again, just going back to that idea of sometimes something negative or challenging or or the opposite, sometimes it's something positive can happen, but with 12th house placements, you may not know about it until later on. Right. And that can be good or bad. It can be positive things happening in the background that you don't know about. I mean, that is where the, I think one, one of the reasons the signification of so-called enemies goes in the 12th house. It's often people kind of working against you, but you don't always see it in your face right away. Mm -hmm. It's like often in the background. Yeah, exactly. Um, as opposed to people that are more obviously front and center, like opponents or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, did we answer that sufficiently? There was like a few questions there. So we answered the benefics in the in the hard houses um, or exalted dignified planets. I think I think that extends to some degree to that. I mean, I do think once you start getting a mixed condition and it's not just about the benefics, then you do get a mix of those topics. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty common for most people, right? Like most people can't avoid like all difficulty in life. And these are some of the places where you see it crop up. So if you have a mixed condition, you'll probably get some of the good things out of those houses and some of the challenging things. And I think that would be true even if you had exalted or dignified planets there, although that would give you the opportunity to have some of the better things come out. Right. In addition to the benefic ones. Um, we didn't address the domicile lord of the hour marker being in a difficult house. Well, uh, you, you did mention that in passing. Yeah, just yeah. the idea that sometimes that's when uh, the person takes on more of the agency of, if it's a benefic, sometimes doing good things in that area. Like, you know, the doctor that had the rule of the ascendant in the sixth, and they were like helping people who were mm -hmm. ill. 
rather than it being something negative about the person themselves becoming ill. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And I think, you know, if your ascendant ruler is in one of those houses, those are just some of the topics that you will come to the forefront a little bit more in your life versus maybe the average person. You know, you're the focus of your life will be drawn a little bit more towards at least one, if not more of those topics. It's not necessarily all of the topics of that house, you know? Yeah. And sometimes the significations either being internalized, is that something you deal with in some way internally, or sometimes you become the agent and they're somehow externalized and you become the agent in terms of carrying out something that matches or is in accord with the significations of that house in your life and in the lives of others? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And it is often a mix, I would say, in terms of the specifics, unless it's like an extreme quality, either extreme negative or extreme positive. But I know that, for example, someone, when I was talking about this on Twitter, replied and says, yes, that's dead on. My ascendant ruler is in the 12th, and I have, on the one hand, had a lot of experience with both mental health and physical health challenges that keep me kind of isolated from from people. But I also have a lot of positive experiences with those kind of metaphysical topics that are very meaningful to me. Right. So it can be things like that. Yeah, definitely. All right. Um, anything else about those or what other question maybe we should move on? Yeah, I think we're done with that one. Okay. Um, what is the next one Let's we should go see. to? Um. There's one about working with children's charts, and there's also one about um, why does the wrong chart work that I kind of wanted to address at least briefly. Yeah, let's do both of those. Okay. Um, I know we both had more to say about the why does the wrong chart work one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, the question was simply, why does the wrong chart work from Delano Strachan on Facebook? I'm sorry if I mispronounced that. Um, so there is an idea floating around in astrology, at least in some circles in astrology, that even if you get the wrong data and you're sitting with a client, that for some reason that chart will still, quote, work and be symbolically significant in the way that you're talking with a person at that moment. Um, and I don't think there are that many proponents. I think, you know, you'd mentioned Jeffrey Cornelius, for instance, as a big one for that. Yeah, I mean, that entire idea comes almost entirely from Jeffrey Cornelius in his mm -hmm. book, The Moment of Astrology. And he builds like a central point in his entire argument in his book. I think he dedicates like a chapter to this like one instance where this this thing that he reports is a phenomenon that he says that other astrologers have reported because it due to chart data issues is something that people will inevitably encounter at some point where a client will give you like the wrong data or somehow you'll end up calculating the wrong chart mm -hmm. and then realizing later let's say during the course of the consultation or after or whatever, that um, you were working with the wrong chart and then you end up recalculating it and then what happens when you're looking at the correct chart with the correct birth data. Mm -hmm. um, and he reported that the wrong chart, whatever the first chart is that's presented itself can be symbolically significant and he tried to argue. I don't want to repeat it because it's been because mm -hmm. it's been years now. But I want to say that he tried to argue that it's just as, if not more, um, symbolically significant than whatever the correct chart data is. Mm -hmm. And that's become this truism then that a lot of people repeat that the incorrect chart can be just as compelling as the correct chart. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's that's like the premise underlying this question. I'm guessing, right? Yeah, I think so. Um, and when I saw this, I was like, well, at least personally, I have a quick answer to that, which is that I have not seen that to be true <laughs> um, and in my personal experiences working with clients. And thankfully, of course, most of the time I've had the correct data. Um, but there have been a couple instances where someone accidentally typed in the wrong number, you know, and I didn't find out until halfway through the consultation. I, I remember one where they accidentally typed in the year wrong. And so it was one year off, you know, it was the right date and month, but wrong one year off. Um, and I, th and the person indeed did not resonate with what I was talking about for the first half of the consultation mm. and, you know, was kind enough to clearly express that and be like, no, that doesn't ring a bell at all. And right. <laughs> which is of course very unnerving as the astrologer to hear that. Well, just one of the things I love actually, as a side note about the idea that skeptics put forward that astrology is entirely a confirmation bias and that like whatever you tell a person they'll just go along with it right. which 
any like practicing astrologer will know is just immediately is not really necessarily always true because mm -hmm. like if, if something's not lining up for a person, they will tell you sometimes, especially yeah. depending on the client type, depending on their personality, uh, some will be more forthright about letting you know that than others. Yeah. But um, sometimes you'll you'll know. Yeah. And especially also if you're soliciting that actively, like does this resonate, you yeah. know, or in what way just does this resonate or not resonate with you? So that person, you know, thankfully was flat out like this doesn't resonate at all. And I was like worried, like what am I doing wrong, you know? Right. But um, so halfway through, I'm like, let's check the data again. Is this correct? And she read it through and she's like, no, that's the wrong year. Wow. I was like, oh. And so this is, that was actually um, a formative experience in like changing my protocols for always checking the data and double checking it with the person um, first thing when I start consultations. Although that said, I've had one where I've, I've even done that and they say yes, but they're still just like looking at it really quickly and it's still not right. So anyway. What do you mean? Um, they say yes, that's the correct data. But oh, then. And then later, so they later, confirm it. They look at it and they're like, oh, actually, no, that's it was not. wrong. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. So, and you know, that's what they've typed in. So I'm depending on them to type it in correctly. Um, anyway, thankfully that hasn't happened often, but when it has, the person has not thought that the chart was just as good as the correct birth chart. Now I know in that one where it was a year off, then we adjusted the chart, we're like, all right, you have to of course change everything on the fly and start talking without preparation for this new chart. Um, but then when I started talking about that, she was like, oh yes, yes, that fits now. So I think it's actually somewhat erroneous, the you know somewhat popular idea that the wrong chart can work just as, as closely as well as the right chart. And I think that also depends on, are you saying specific things? Are you doing the type of astrology where you're saying somewhat specific things about these placements, right. where it's not broad enough that this could apply to most people? Mm -hmm. And in that case, it's either true or not true for that person, Right. at least up to this point in their life. Like this has been the most difficult area of your life, and this has been the most positive area of your life, or what have you? Yeah. Or your ascendant rulers in this house and these topics should have been more important in your life so far. Yeah. Yeah, I remember years ago, like Rob Hand addressing this in a lecture at like a Northwest Astrology Conference or something, and he said something similar, which is mm -hmm. he was just like, I've never had an instance where the correct chart didn't match the person's life more mm -hmm. and wasn't more applicable and relevant and accurate in describing the life than whatever the initial fake chart was. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's always been my experience as well, that um, things fall into place more when you do have the correct one. So there might be some like issue where maybe sometimes like an incorrect chart and whatever you end up talking about, because you've also got like other, all these other layers, like the consultation chart at the mm -hmm. time and other things where, you know, something that was said to the native, the, the client or whatever at that moment could have been what they needed to hear or that what they didn't need to hear. Um, so maybe there's other overlapping reasons why sometimes a consultation could still have symbolically significant information that was presented at that time that could be relevant. Mm -hmm. um, there's also more frequently than getting the entire birth year wrong and just being like way off with a the chart, there can just be more frequently it's just like time issues mm -hmm. where it's like an hour off. Right. So you have like an ascendant that's still in the same sign, but it's you know much earlier or much later, or it's like mm -hmm. switched one sign. And so some of the transits will still be the same, and there's still be things that you'll talk about that will still be accurate, mm -hmm. if not precisely so. Yeah. Um, so there's different overlapping reasons why on a minor or mm -hmm. uh, you know, much more restrictive level that may be true that sometimes you can still end up saying, correct things indirectly, but mm. I also don't fully agree with that premise and I, I wish that it wasn't as common. I mean, it's one of those things I'd been meaning to for for years to do sort of a critique of some of Jeffrey Cornelius's arguments because while mm. I respect um, the core of it, and I think that a core part of what he argued about astrology being divination to some extent, I think was very important and not just influential, but also reconnected us astrologically with a huge part of our tradition and how it was originally conceptualized 2,000 years ago, mm. um, there were parts of that that I didn't agree with 
um, and the complete rejection that there's anything objectively true about astrology to a certain extent, uh, I think is one of those things that I wish wasn't didn't get picked up as much. There's there's certain right. parts of his, his argument that I think are weaker than others, and I think that's that's one of them. Yeah, and I think it's a piece of like that argument taken to an extreme. It's like all moments are sig symbolically significant in some fashion, mm. and um, you know, so you can work with whatever's in front of you, kind of thing. Yeah, which is it really does come from like the horary mm -hmm. area and like yeah. the divination area or the area of astrology that's more explicitly divinatory, like other explicitly divinatory things like tarot right. or or what have you. Right, and you know the horary chart or the chart of the moment or the consultation chart, all of those do speak to that. I'm you know I wouldn't reject any of that. Um, it's just more like when you take that to the extreme, you get something like well, even if you have the wrong birth chart, it still works. Yeah, or that it works better or is like more important somehow than the mm -hmm. needle chart. But yeah, and then it's like rectification and other things. I can't get away even if I do think there's a divinatory element to astrology. And I think that's actually an important and maybe even overlooked um, underlying principle for how to understand why astrology works and how it's valid and also some of the ways in which astrologers might struggle to be able to legitimize astrology in terms of statistics or things like that. Mm -hmm. um, I still can't get away from the idea that there's still some um, objective phenomenon that's occurring out there that is not entirely subjective and not entirely that, that there's some other piece to it. Absolutely. And at the very least, the birth charts represent that symbolic moment in time. And you can't just change that to any other moment. Right. You know, that that might be the divinatory moment is when someone is born, but then you have that chart and you can't exchange it for any other chart. Yeah, that that was the moment of birth and the moment of birth um, itself reflected something about the future, the quality of the native's life as well as their future and their, their fate. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that's a whole big topic. But anyways, so the basic answer to that question is um, there may be different reasons why the chart might work or still contain some compelling symbolism, including the consultation chart mm -hmm. or you know, things like transits that can be true even if you don't have the exact time right. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, in our opinion at least, the correct chart is always going to be more compelling and it's going to work better than whatever incorrect chart you're working with. And that's also yeah. part of our fundamental premise of like rectification and things like that, that you can mm -hmm. find the correct chart because there's something true about that chart that does describe the native's life better uh, and more more not just adequately but is more compelling than the incorrect chart mm -hmm. and that is based on specifics and concrete things in the chart and not just broad sweeping you know you're shy but you're also outgoing kind of things that skeptics often think about yeah it's like you know this part of your life um has been particularly fortunate in this part of your life has been particularly unfortunate in some way and then right. figuring out the specific details underlying that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Uh, what was the other question that you had? It was about, where did it go? Um, using astrology with children. Is it helpful? Is it ethical? And this was, I think, from a Patreon um, listener. Okay. Eilish Kress. Um, so, what is the answer to that? I mean, we. This is tricky because, like, um, especially in our ages, I mean, my, in our various <laughs> ages, uh, which I may not say uh, that um, we neither of us does that much work with children or has have that many friends necessarily that we're sort of observing raised children. So it's not as sort of personal for us as a question necessarily, but it's an interesting like abstract, like philosophical question sometimes. Well, so it's come up for me a little bit. Um, okay. I don't specialize in children's charts. Some people do more of like family astrology or, you know, synastry between parents and children, that kind of thing. Yeah. Or, um, or like um, one astrologer like Alex Trenoweth is like the astrology, like teaching children and is a teacher and mm -hmm. has done talks on that on, um, you know, educational ways that astrology 
works for children. Right. And for teenagers and like age cohorts, like Jupiter signs and Saturn signs and things like that. Yeah. Um, so that can be really interesting, I think. Um, so I don't specialize in those particular topics. Uh, what I've done so far anyway, is I have on occasion talked with parents about their children's charts. But for me, it's always been so far at least, it may change in the future um, or not, but it's been when I've already had one of those parents as a client. And so I've already had a session with them and it's gone well and they seem grounded as people. And at the end of the session, they're like, so what about children's charts? Because they have children and they wanna, and so the instances in which I've done sessions with someone about their children's charts have been when I've already done a consult with the person and they seem grounded enough and kind of like realistic enough about these things. Um, and also the, that they have two, they have some particular thing coming up where they want to help their children with something, some challenge that's coming up. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't usually do it out of curiosity specifically. Um, I don't just like, oh, I'm curious about what my kids' charts are like. I also don't do it for very, very young children or babies thus far. Okay. Um, so that's a limit for you? Yes. I mean, and maybe there would be an instance in which someone would bring that up where I would say yes, but so far there has not been. Because I do think there's something to be said in terms of babies or, you know, children for the first couple of years or so where, you know, there's something probably good about parents just getting to know them as people mm -hmm. without like having preconceptions. Yeah. Without projecting ideas about who they will who be, they should be or yeah. should be based on mm -hmm. their chart. Yeah. yeah. And what I think like, ask, doesn't Astro Dean still have that? I know they used to have that as a restriction where... They wouldn't, I think, offer interpretations mm, on charts if it was under a certain number of years, like under seven or something like that, which huh. I, I assumed was coming from one of the psychological schools like Liz Green, yeah. Liz Green or something like that. Okay. Yeah, I haven't checked back in a while on that, but that does kind of sound familiar. Um, yeah, so I think there's something to be said about that. And typically the parents I've also done sessions about their children's charts for have already clearly, and this is obviously kind of a subjective sense you get through talking with someone rather than like a clear bar to say, but they sound like they already know their children. They know who they are. They know what kind of personalities they have, and they're just trying to help them more. Mm -hmm. So those are the instances in which I've occasionally done children's charts. Um, and Versus like they're like a helicopter parent and they're trying to figure yeah. out how to micromanage their child's life or something like that. Right, and that's why I try to make sure the person seems grounded to begin with, be that they're gonna do good things with the information rather than it's going to be like a negative thing, mm -hmm. right? Because you can see potentials for either, right? Yeah, well, I mean, and you hope. I mean, that's one of the one of the few experiences I've had that gave me pause for this is I remember years ago, a friend of mine had a child and it was like their first child and it had some aspect like Mercury, Neptune and like, Years later, they I must have given some general delineation about the chart, um, and years later, they tried to say that I had said that their child would have a learning disability or something mm. like that, mm -hmm. which I don't remember like whatever the specific delineation was that I gave, but I know um, like ninety nine percent sure that I would not have like predicted that your child yeah. would have a learning disability, mm -hmm. and what that meant and my takeaway from that was sometimes what the parent hears especially if you're talking about um, possible challenges or something, maybe different than what you say, um, mm -hmm. what you actually say to them and what you think you're saying as the astrologer, which is right. always an issue you run into anyways, just mm -hmm. you know, um, having clients as an astrologer and what the astrologer says versus what the person hears. But it sometimes can have like greater impl implications if you're talking to um, parents about their child in like long term implications. And so that really did give me pause about mm -hmm. saying things um, about a, a child's chart to parents in the future. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. And you don't know, even if they do seem grounded and practical and all those good things, you don't know if there's still potentials for that. Yeah. Well, and also, like, what is their uh, orientation towards astrology? Like, how much do they know about it? How much do they mm -hmm. not know about it? How likely are they going to be like take that information um, with a grain of salt and apply it sensibly versus are they going to get hung up on something? Mm -hmm. like, there's just, like a lot of vari variables there. Mm -hmm. And it, it also runs into almost um, this question that sometimes comes up in astrology about reading like third person charts. Right. 
and how appropriate or inappropriate that is. And there's some astrologers, especially lately, that have started taking much more extreme views on that about not. Mm-hmm. Or some, in some ethical guidelines for like ESAR and stuff, I believe they say that you're supposed to get permission to read any charts. Uh, so mm-hmm. when it comes to parents and their children, you do run into a question there about the ethicalness to some extent of like reading the child's chart. Um, yeah. Without, yeah. without their consent or something. For sure. And I would worry personally about that if they were like a little older. Mm. But either way, they're going to grow up. And then at some point, they may know that their parent has had a consultation about their chart, you know? So, yeah. I mean, I do remember someone, it's kind of in the distant past, but I do remember someone saying it was a negative thing for them because their parent had done like consultations or new astrology or new not knew it well, but like knew enough to go to astrologers to get consultations about her chart, about the daughter's chart, and then mm-hmm. that the mom was kind of like neurotic about it. So I could see the potential. Hopefully that doesn't happen most of the time. But yeah, you're not in control of that as the astrologer, what they do with that information later. Yeah. I mean, it could either go any way, either way. And I wasn't, I was presenting like the negative side, and then astro- some astrologers take a strong negative point of view on that. But then, you know, there's also a positive way in which it could be helpful and it could mm-hmm. give. The parent, ideally, in the best case scenario, like greater insight into um, the child and some of the areas of strength or challenge to help the parent better anticipate and raise the child in a way that's conducive mm-hmm. and like helpful and um, nurturing to the child. Exactly. That they might not know or have otherwise. Right. Yeah, and that's the same premise as um. What is that? What is that like school, the like water schools and things like that? Mm -hmm. Um, Same kind of premise where like different kids are different temperaments Mm. and we want to help them in the very specific ways that they learn and grow compared to like another child. Right. So it's like there can be positives to knowing, you know, the specifics of how this child is unique um, or their particular tendencies or whatever. Um, Yeah. And I think in the ones that I've talked to, it, They've said it has been helpful in that respect. I mean, I think one caveat is that, you know, if you're talking about children's charts, you want to talk about everything that's like age appropriate and sort of disregard everything that isn't, you Mm, know? So, well, things involving perhaps like learning styles or personality traits that might be generally helpful for a parent to like work with rather than against. Um, So, you know, maybe like their basic, you know, ascendant, sun, moon. I think you get to basics oftentimes when you're doing children's charts Mm -hmm. and kind of interpreting them broadly so that the parent can then kind of look out for that, but not like a specific one thing. Um, You know, mercury type of placements, I think, for learning or communication. Um, You know, maybe it's more personality oriented Mm -hmm. rather than like predicting exactly x will happen when the child is 45 years old or something like that yes exactly so more focused on personality um sometimes transits though i would say and um i even had one interesting one where someone had one child who was doing really really well in school and the other who was like exhibiting major learning difficulties and doing the opposite and um you know in addition to some of the basic House placements, I noticed there's a diacal releasing from spirit. This has actually been kind of fascinating. Look at looking at a few select like children's charts with zodiacal releasing. Exact opposite, you know, in the ways that you would expect in terms of like one was one child was born into like the best possible one, and that child was doing very, very well and excelling in school. Mm-hmm. And the other one was, you know, born into the hardest one. And I think that's one of the places you have to obviously have more conversation before you get to that point to bring in something like that if it's appropriate. But in this case, it was helpful to the parent who said, oh, okay, that's actually really good to know because then I can make sure to get this child more support, like more learning support, maybe some extra tutoring and things like that Mm -hmm. because it didn't look like it was going to suddenly become like way easier soon. Right. So I think that was actually like a really good example of how that can be helpful. Yeah, for sure. Um. Yeah, it's so complicated. And I feel like every answer to every question that we've given so far is that. And you and I probably overdo it in to a certain extent in being like nuanced about everything and trying mm-hmm. to outline both sides and seeing both sides, even if we come down on one. Um, you know, because there's so many other parts of this, like what happens when you sit down to read the child's chart. And then you're seeing like major parent stuff placements where it's Mm -hmm. describing the parent and the relationship with the parent and that being an area of difficulty and then questions about like why is that an area of difficulty and is that Mm -hmm. an ongoing thing 
or, or describing the relationship or describing the parent themselves or is it describing some circumstance with the parent at some point in the native's life. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think that is one of the reasons why for children's charts in particular, I'm much more circumscribed about what I will say and feel much more fine than I would in other consultations about leaving lots of things out. Because mm -hmm. some of the things are not relevant yet, you know, um, in terms of age appropriate things. Some of them are just like, that's not what's going to be helpful out of this cons consultation, even if it's something you can see as a potential. Yeah. Like what is going to be useful and what, what are you going to, what's the person like actually going to do with that information right. versus what is not necessarily useful? Mm hmm Exactly. And that being a recurring issue for the astrologer, um, not just in this situation, but in, in others as well. Yeah. And I always think about that with consultations, but that is definitely the area in which I feel most fine about like not saying everything that I could possibly see. Because it's not always relevant. It's not what they're there for. It's not going to what's going to be actionable, you know, those sorts of things. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I feel that way as well. Um, I often lean more in that case when it comes to clients and stuff. And I know every time we mention this on the podcast, there's always somebody inevitably that's just like, you should always tell the truth and say 100% of everything you see. And I no. <laughs> I just don't, I don't feel like that's that's the case all the time. No. And especially like in this kind of thing you're talking about, like, what if you see like, okay, there's a decent chance of like the parents getting divorced because you see that in the kids chart or something. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not helpful right now. You know, right? that's not helpful for the parent helping to guide, you know, their children and growing. Like it may be something that may happen down the road. It may also happen 15 years down the road. So that's not helpful to talk about now, you know? Right. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. And not wanting to create like a self-fulfilling prophecy Yeah. Um, and all sorts of complicated things. Yeah, for sure. So it is about the purpose. You don't always have to talk about everything. So what was the answer? What was the, how's the question framed again? Using astrology with children, is it helpful? Is it ethical? I think it I think you have to make sure that it's ethical in terms of like being more careful. Yeah, you have to maybe ex exercise more care and caution and, mm -hmm. and restraint than you might otherwise. I wonder if that's an age thing cuz I've already established mm -hmm. earlier that uh, just by experience, it's like easier to read a chart for somebody that's older and is much further through their life because mm -hmm. they've already experienced the highs and lows, and they already kind of you're just sort of confirming some things that they're already aware of for the most part about mm -hmm. the areas that are difficult or are more easy or fortunate for them. Whereas mm -hmm. it's more challenging to read a chart for somebody that's like a teenager in their 20s or something because so much of the major events in their life may not have happened yet. Um, in terms mm -hmm. of like career or marriage or things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe this is just a continued extension of that about it being more difficult in some ways reading the chart of somebody that's even younger in their first few years of life, but also mm -hmm. needing to exercise even more restraint because you have the potential to alter the trajectory much more depending on what you say and what you go into. Yeah, exactly. I feel like I should throw in one more thing, which is I've I've been asked by a few parents to look at like the synastry between parents and children. Mm. But I I really like to do that only in the same vein as we've been talking about recently here. Um, if they already have kind of um observed what the dynamics are, and then you're just sort of like confirming it, like, okay, yes, this is a strong-willed personality who is also running up against you and is apt to feel like you're more of like you know, a major, you're always going to think parents are authority figures, but you know, in some cases more than others, there's going to be like sinistry aspects where that's going to exacerbate that a little bit more. And so, yeah, and I've had some conversations where I'm like, yeah, I see that potential being kind of like an ongoing dynamic, but it's really, it's tough because those were people I knew personally where I'm like, okay, this is not going to make or break their relationship where they're going to take this as sort of a useful confirmation. Like I have to be careful about this piece of our dynamic, you know, mm -hmm. rather than use it against them or something, you know? Right. So it's tough. I mean, those are some of the reasons why I don't like to specialize in this, but I do think in select instances it can be actually helpful rather than not helpful. Yeah, um, definitely. If used well and, and carefully and like, I don't know, judiciously, there's positive things that you can get out of it. Mm -hmm. um, and what's funny about something like this is there's definitely, there's going to be people that come down on extreme sides either way, you know, and there's different mm -hmm 
approaches to astrology and different practices and different people put value in different things. And um, you know, so more power to them. We're trying to sort of cover both sides here mm. and incline towards one side or another, saying it's probably more helpful and we do this. Mm. But certainly there's a, a range of different views in the astrological community. Right. And there's one more thing, I guess, with children's charts is you can talk about temporary influences. Usually everybody assumes like you're talking about just the birth chart itself. But you can actually say, okay, yeah, this this kid is going to be stressed in this particular area this year, and then it'll probably lessen after this year. And those can be helpful things to know too in terms of the transits mm, right. for the parents. Yeah, definitely. Um, it also goes back to just a principle. To me, astrology is still so much primarily like a passive spectator sport, mm. and it's something that's interesting to go through life and like live life and experience and then just sort of in parallel in the back of your mind watching the transits and like showing how it's lining up with certain events and how your birth chart and those indications play out in certain ways. Um, but you're not necessarily always like doing things differently as a result of that. Hmm. And I think that's one of the reasons why it's useful to be an astrologer, at least to give yourself some training in astrology if you're going to try to um, incorporate astrology into your life because of developing more of that um, observational sort of mindset as well versus always attempting to control it and sort of like manipulate things using that information. Mm -hmm. Maybe that also is more just going back to my own temperament and philosophical outlook and inclining more towards stoicism and thing like things like that as well versus other practitioners. Mm -hmm. But that's one of the reasons, it's one of the ways that I think you can be more careful with astrology is, is just observing the correlations mm -hmm. and finding that fascinating and giving you insight into life as you're living it instead of it being something that interrupts or is used to dictate one's life or mm -hmm. in some instances is misapplied in a way that's that's problematic or dangerous. Mm, definitely. Yeah. Or just knowing time frames for things and just going, okay, this is when I can expect this. Sometimes my sister, who is not an astrologer but kind of thinks it's interesting, will message me and be like, okay, are the planets doing bad things right now? <laughs> and I'll be like, yes, yes, indeed they are. <laughs> and um, and like, so when that, when is that one over? Be like, end of the year. Like, okay, cool. <laughs> yeah. So and just giving you some possible timeframes may be sufficient and useful in and of itself and setting um, some low level expectations. Like, mm -hmm. you know, Saturn went into Capricorn in 20, December of 2017. And it's been transiting this area of my chart. And there's been some challenges in this area. And knowing that. Saturn leaves Capricorn and that transits over in December of 2020. So you've right. got that like three year period and you've got this much more time until it's it's up. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, so were there, I think there were other questions, right? Um, I mean, there are other possible questions. How are we on time? How long have we been talking? We're at one hour and 56 minutes. So we're coming up on two hours. So we might be able to fit in like one or two more questions really quick. Mm, okay. Let's see. Um, one of them was like the role that bias plays in astrology. Yeah, that doesn't, that could either be a really short or a really long answer, I feel like. Yeah. Let's cover um, our short answers. Are there good ones that have short answers? Because if not, I'll want to come back to that one. Oh, yeah. No, I meant we could give our short answer for that one. Um, let me see any of the other ones. Um, the role that astrology has made a difference in people's lives. Oh, yeah. There are a couple of really meaty questions in here um, about the difference it's made in people's lives or um, how has it affected or informed how you think about other things. But those are long answer questions. Yeah. Um, let's do the bias one because okay. it's actually relevant with the current election season. Mm -hmm. um, so the question was from Twitter at J Say. J Says Yay. Astro. J, J says yay, Astro. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. They say the role bias plays in astrology from experience with signs slash placements to one's experience with a personal transit versus someone else. General transit, generally just looking at the difference slash separation between the astrologer versus astrology or just however you view it. Yeah. So I think, you know, that's speaking to not just bias in terms of like your politics or things like more overt like that, mm -hmm. but also more subtle potential biases like 
if you personally have certain placements in your chart and you've experienced them a certain way or had certain transits versus not had other transits or have friends versus enemies with different placements. Yeah, if you've been in like a relationship with somebody that has certain placement and it like went bad and therefore you don't like that placement or you associate that placement with some negative experience you had or something like that. Right. As one example. Yeah. <laughs> um. um so but the election thing, I think this is a really pertinent question right now because it's one of those times when it becomes really evident mm -hmm. when like you start seeing all over social media and especially like blogs and YouTube channels, you start seeing astrologers issue like predictions mm -hmm. about um, the outcome of things like presidential elections. And sometimes it becomes clear that the astrologers' personal politics are interfering with in some way or influencing in some way, let's say, what their prediction is. Mm -hmm. Um, and we've also noticed this just become an issue over the past few years, especially with political astrology, but with just with the news in general, hmm. where um, like astrologers need context in order to interpret a chart and in order right. to interpret planetary alignments. Mm -hmm. And their um, range of possible predictions of possible outcomes is entirely predicated on the context of their starting point and what they're taking into account as possible outcomes. Mm -hmm. And then they, so that's like from a practical standpoint, they have a range of possible scenarios that will happen when you're talking about a specific um, event. And then they try to use the astrology to narrow down based on the range of scenarios that they think are plausible or in within their field of view, mm -hmm. what the most likely outcome will be. Right. Um, but the problem is that it's almost like an unreliable narrator problem where that you have in in like stories or movies and stuff, which is uh, the range of possible outcomes and scenarios entirely depends on um, you know what news and information you're taking into account, and therefore mm. what your expected outcomes might be like what, mm -hmm. what range of scenarios is limited by the news and information that that you regularly are taking into account mm. and what scenarios are being outlined as a result of that right but if there's some if there's any bias that goes into that uh, which there often is in terms of the news and information that a person takes into account then that's going to affect the range of scenarios that you can attempt to anticipate as an astrologer mm -hmm. All right, so I was saying that um, we took a little bit of a break there. I was saying that um, you know the news and information that a person takes in like affects and directly outlines the range of possibilities that they consider mm -hmm. when they're looking at the astrology, just like in the same way that when you're looking at a chart, you need to know if it's the chart of a human or like a turtle or if it's the chart of an event like a city or a marriage or what to provide you the context with which you're going to try to interpret the chart and make specific statements about possible outcomes in different parts of the life of whatever that entity is. Mm -hmm. Anyways, in the same way, um, obviously, especially in the US, every four years it becomes very obvious and it's become increasingly obvious over the past decade that a person's that the um, media that a person consumes affects the range of possibilities that they're going to consider for um, making political predictions based on what what options are they, they even think are are possibilities basically mm -hmm. right and yeah that starts becoming really obvious um, in this context. There's other context in which I'm sure, non-political context in which I'm sure it's relevant as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's one of the areas where, I guess, um, from a social standpoint, where it's become more important about different um, groups wanting to broaden the like nature of um, the discourse in the astrological community when it comes to things like sexual orientation, for example, where so many of the um, delineations, let's say 30 or 40 years ago, were written specifically for like um, 
assuming that the reader is like heterosexual or something like that mm -hmm. versus you know not necessarily being able to take that for granted obviously in 2020 and mm -hmm. needing to adapt um the astrology to remove to some extent that level of bias or at least take into account that potential bias on the part of the person mm -hmm. so that's an it's example an obvious example of where bias comes into play politics is another and we'll see a lot of that soon mm -hmm. um right. yeah yeah, I mean, I've definitely seen that jump out lately, probably even more so than four years ago. You could see it some four years ago. Um, I'm not sure before that, but I'm, I'm sure it's always been an issue, but it seems like it is, it is an increasing issue, like you said, because of kind of people are taking as factual information wherever they're getting their inf their news. And, you know, yeah, sometimes it's not reporting all the same things. Yeah, I mean, the, you know? what's the, and the news itself has become much more polarized, whereas mm -hmm. it used to be a little bit more, um, let's say, homogenous, if that's the right word. Yeah, well, you know, and things specifically, at least in the U.S., um, like the Fairness Doctrine that got knocked down at some point. I forget what year that was. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, n news channels used to have to report, like, people on, you know, differing sides of a spectrum or things like that, or um, there were specific rules that aren't there anymore. And so people can sort of say more of what they want, and that might be straight news, and that might actually be more editorializing than one might realize if they're watching it over the course of a long time. Mm -hmm. So anyway, yeah, that that hugely matters because then people take that as their starting point for like interpreting the symbology of astrology, interpreting what's going on now or what's going on for the election or that kind of thing. And I think to some extent, I mean, the question is always around this kind of thing, like, is it possible to remove that? Is it possible right. to be completely objective? You know, um, I think it's not as possible if people aren't getting all of the same information or aren't believing all the same information. Sure. Um, I think that's one piece. Um, I think beyond that, some people are going to be either more intentional about trying to step outside of what they personally want to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and some people are going to be also, there's an, the intention is one piece, and then some people are actually going to be better at enacting that than other people. Yeah. I mean, um, being free of bias is definitely something to strive for and to attempt to mm. accomplish to some extent because presumably your ability to delineate the astrology and this, because this, I always bring up this like quote from Zoller, because it was one of the few things that he said to me that always really stuck with me when I lived in the same house as him in the mid 2000s. But Robert Zoller said he had this thing that always sounded like I was considered it to be like extremist astrology at the time and found it distasteful. But he said that the astrology was the only true measure of reality. And the astrology was always reflecting the truth about what was going on in reality. Mm. Um, and that you had to just say what the astrology said, even if it didn't seem to be the case or something like that, because it was everything else that would get in the way. And um, I, or, or something like that. I'm not. I'm actually mm -hmm. not not repeating it very correctly now. But his point of view was just that the astrology is always correct. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I found ways of become more amicable to that point of view over the past decade and a half than I was at the time mm. because of seeing the way that our own biases um, act as like a, a lens through which we view everything, including the astrology, mm -hmm. and how sometimes that can work against us in terms of accurately making um, correct predictions about what will happen in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think that's all true. I mean, I think there's a certain extent, though, in terms of that, like, multiplicities of manifestations kind of thing, where, yeah, even if you're trying to very clearly see the astrology, there's still some different, you know, shades of what that might mean, mm -hmm. um, or different specifics of what that might mean. And yeah. so I see this a lot, for instance, like, when people are talking about political events and they say, like, they see a Neptune thing, and Neptune thing is either... To one person, there's delusion going on with this person, you know, or to someone else, it's like this person is really idealist and wants to work for the good of everyone with fewer sort of ego driven motivations, you know, like you can, you could uh, back either of those up probably with whatever you want to. Mm -hmm. So um, those are just some of the ways I, I see that it's not always 100% 
free of bias even when you want to be. Like Right. Yeah. I mean bias is context. Yes. Like, bias is what your bias is is the context with which you're approaching the chart and everybody's going to approach a chart with some kind of um, bias or some kind of context mm. that's going to incline you in a certain direction. Um, as the astrologer, of course, ideally you're going to work as much as you can to counteract that, and I do think that is possible to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. um, and it's important sometimes to step outside of yourself and, and consider possibilities that you didn't um, that are possible astrologically, but that for some reason you might be limiting yourself due to your own biases in seeing or or considering as possible outcomes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, you know, so, so 2016 election was a great example of that where the whole election was so crazy and the way that everything happened relatively quickly and unexpectedly um, with Trump's rise, um, you know, caught a lot of people off guard and there were some astrologers that were just like, um, that's just not you know, plausible mm -hmm. that, that Trump would be president was some people's like blind spot or something, mm -hmm. both Republicans as well as Democrat astrologers in the US. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, much a lot of people's surprise, like that actually did become the case. And therefore anybody that was like ruling that out on any, let's say, conscious level or even subconscious level, that level of bias was like factoring into their ability to make a correct prediction. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's something relevant here as well. Just understanding the full range of possibilities and not being limited by um, by things that are influencing you from a practical standpoint. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think you know different people are going to be better or worse uh, about that than others, um, and more intentional about it than others. But that said, I do want to kind of push back a little bit on. It, it's kind of become a little bit popular to sort of dismiss the whole thing and be like, all astrologers have their own bias and they're all expressing that through their astrology. Right. You know, and I do think that's actually overstated. Mm -hmm. I, I think some astrologers do that more markedly and, um, and you can kind of clearly see these are their personal inclinations and, you know, and that is always their political predictions through astrology or something like that. Mm -hmm. But um, that's not true for everyone. You know. Yeah, I mean, there are people that strive, uh, do a better job at striving to make statements that are um, less free or, or more free of bias than others. Mm -hmm. And there's some people that instead almost do the opposite and kind of revel in the bias and the, the their personal perspective and like speaking to a certain audience mm -hmm. who has a similar um, perspective on life or or political affiliation or what have you as them. Mm -hmm. Right. And maybe there's you know there's a place for that either way of the attempts to be free of bias versus the um, sometimes desire to lean into one's worldview. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and aside from politics, I mean, I think there's also more subtle but common ways that this question is speaking to in terms of do you have experience with certain placements and charts and what that has meant in the past that you've yeah. seen? I think that is another one of those things that gets better with time in terms of, especially if you're a consulting astrologer, because you talk to more and more people and see many more instances of specific manifestations than you would ever get just studying. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's actually really important and one of the best reasons to you know talk with other people about their charts, even when you're not fully sure that you're there yet because you are you just have to get that experience. Um, and it's it's getting experience doing the consultations, but it's also getting experience with what these things can mean in real life outside of your personal sphere. Yeah. Uh, well, because one of the biggest pieces of bias is actually your own birth chart and mm -hmm. the way that you've experienced certain transits mm -hmm. and like noticed the correlations may um, subtly and imperceptibly bias you and how you read that for other people. Mm -hmm. Like if Saturn transits have often been more constructive for you, let's say you have Saturn in a day chart and it's relatively well placed. Mm -hmm. And like your Saturn return was a period of like hard work, but ultimately like success or something like that, mm -hmm. you may sit down with somebody at the consultation who is actually going through great um 
great challenges and great trauma or great setbacks mm -hmm. and and loss or other things during their Saturn return. And if you sit down, I mean, this is usually your hobby horse. It is. <laughs> <laughs> but if you sit down and like um, start telling them, you know, you just have to put hard work into it and, and be optimistic and then everything will turn out fine. And that may be just completely disconnected from what their actual reality is because your mm -hmm. bias based on your own birth chart is is um, giving you a blind spot for what some other people's experience is like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And I think that is one of the best reasons to talk with lots of people about their chart experiences and transit experiences and things like that. Because then you know it's not just about what you've experienced or people close to you. You have a much wider pool of like real life manifestations to draw on. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's really important because also everyone's going to have different shades of those things, you know, not just like day chart Saturn versus night chart ch Saturn, but like really well placed versus really poorly placed versus symbolizing in sort of more inherently positive or negative topics, things like that. So um, yeah, that is important to just like draw a wider pool of experience. And I think that's true both in terms of talking with people about their chart placements and timing um, manifestations, but also about life in general. And this is actually, I have like a pinned tweet about this um, on my Twitter page, but it's about you know, we only kind of have more experience with the slices of life that we've personally been privy to, mm -hmm. but the world is very big. And, you know, the range of what people can experience in life is very large. And you're probably not, without seeking it out, have, you know, you won't have seen all of it. So even things like reading broadly, you know, about different things that go on in different countries and different cultures and different subcultures, um, you know, getting to know lots of different kinds of people um, from different walks of life. I think this is all very important because astrology is actually about life, you know, and life is very large. <laughs> so, yeah. um, it's one of the other areas calling back to a previous question about just needing to be a jack of all trades is that astrology mm -hmm. is such a broad subject that you're going to have to train yourself in like many, many, or at least become familiar with many, many different areas of life mm -hmm. and. Uh, specialties and specialty areas in mm -hmm. order to be uh, good as an astrologer. Right. And, you know, each astrologer might choose to specifically specialize in certain things, you know, and that's completely fine. And then you'll probably be better at those things because you do, you know, pay attention to it more frequently. Um, but to some extent, you know, the anti, you know, the way to work against potential bias in, you know, influencing your astrology is to just make yourself more familiar with many more things, mm -hmm. um, many more subjects, but also many more people's lives. Yeah, um, being open to just seeing perspectives and lives and people approaching things that are different from you and to uh, as neutrally as you can sort of assess what's going on mm -hmm. and try to free yourself of your own blind spots and biases as much as possible, especially when presented with something that is um, out of the ordinary or, or co seems to contradict or stand out from some presumption that you were making up to that point mm -hmm. and try to understand what happened and why that was. Right. And if you're actually in like a consulting context, also the anti another anti-bias tool is simply making sure you're listening enough, mm -hmm. you know, rather than being too quick to be like, this is what this means. Like, listen a little bit first and, you know, see what this person is saying about their experience of this this piece of their chart. Mm -hmm. And don't, probably don't tell them they're wrong, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, to, you know, this, this could be like a larger tangent, but yeah. You know, listen as much as you speak to make sure that you're hearing the person's actual life experience and not what you assume this should play out as. Because oftentimes that's actually the way you will gain greater experience with what different manifestations can come about is hearing other people tell you that. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely true. I mean, the other side is also true that sometimes people don't have a very objective grasp on their life in certain areas and might have blind spots and therefore the astrologer telling them something they may or may not mm. hear the right way depending on what their blind spots are. Right. And that's why I was saying that could be a whole tangent. Yeah. But <laughs> Um, all right. So going back to bias, I mean, bias also extends to one of the things you have to do as an astrologer is find this balance. And it's a very difficult balance to find your footing of. And it's something I think people go back and forth with at different points between 
um, learning what a placement means and taking it into account and applying it in the future as a possible outcome when you see a similar placement or constellation of placements or, or alignment in the future um, and going into it having learned something and having a sort of presumption about that placement in the future versus um, sometimes the downside of that being having a, a bias towards certain placements or a blind spot isn't the right word, but of um, um, like almost like a prejudice against a certain placement, which mm -hmm. in in the worst or most extreme cases is like X placement is always like this, or mm -hmm. I hate all you know X zodiac signs because yeah. they're all like this or what have you. Yeah, and sometimes that can translate into there can be more complex versions of that that's still the same thing, which is like. Um, Let's say having a relationship, getting into a relationship with somebody that had this rising sign with the ruler of the ascendant and this sign, and like two or three other placements, and then meeting somebody else, let's say a few years later, that has um, half of the same placements, and therefore having a bias or a prejudice and expecting similar things from them, mm -hmm. um, and needing to. On the one hand, being open to seeing the repetition of similar themes, but on the other hand, not prejudging somebody or prejudging how a relationship will happen before it's actually played out. Mm -hmm, definitely, that's another area of potential bias that I feel like is a it's a struggle as an astrologer because you have to find a middle ground between those two extremes. Mm -hmm, definitely, yeah, and I think you know people always have the experience of like. Sinistry with certain placements being like better for them personally than others. And you actually, like, at least if you're trying to do this more professionally or even using astrology in your own life, you should ideally try to, like, you know, acknowledge that, but also push a little bit past it. Um, certainly, if you're going to be consulting astrologer, because you're going to be talking to lots of people. Mm -hmm. And while it is true that you do tend to often draw people who have interesting sinistry with your own chart, um, that's not always going to be the case. Yeah, that's a good point. That is based on there may be certain signs in your chart um, or certain placements that you get into conflict with more often, just based on how that hits your chart or hits certain placements in your chart, and you may therefore develop a sort of bias against certain placements or certain signs of the zodiac as a result of that. But it could be something that's unique to you. Mm -hmm. That's I mean, I mean, even that's tricky though, because sometimes what you develop is a unique, unique sensitivity to. The negative manifestations mm -hmm. of that, right. which can sometimes make you better at being able to articulate what the problem is with that. On the other hand, it could also be a blind spot where you could apply that inappropriately to um, people that, let's say, ha are able to manifest a more constructive version of that. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's actually one of those things that you should actually be very conscious about with yourself. Like, yes, I don't always like expressions of this particular sign. And that's probably because I have certain placements that either have neg negative sinistry with that, or I mean, I can actually throw out a few examples that are kind of common. Like, sometimes when people have, um, when someone else has placements that like land in your sixth or 12th, or someone has placements conjunct your sign of your Saturn, or things like that, or your Mars. Yeah. Um, or, or certain placements that were in like your parents charts mm -hmm. and then you run into them again later and like par parental dynamics right. are like triggered in in your head. Yeah, exactly. So there's lots of kind of things where it's actually really good to be conscious of those cuz I don't think you can actually 100% eradicate your feelings around that. Mm -hmm. Um but you can try to set them aside temporarily, you know, and be more conscious and try to more consciously like deliberately counteract them a little bit if you're working with people. Right. So I guess then the conclusion and part of the answer we come to there is bias is a potential um, threat or challenge that is ever present for astrologers, um, but it's also part of our. Um, it can also be sometimes be an advantage because it's the context that you've developed surrounding certain placements and the point of view that you're coming from. Um, but it's something that you need to constantly try and offset to whatever extent you can in order to, to achieve true neutrality, um, which is probably what the astrology ultimately is. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, we'll, no one will ever probably achieve true neutrality. 
but mm-hmm. it's at least something to that's um, worth striving to for the sake of being accurate. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah. Okay. Good. All right. Well, um, this has been fun. I think we could keep talking all day. There was there were other questions that were interesting. I mean, we actually got like hundreds of questions, yeah, so we only <laughs> grabbed a small, like a handful of some of the best ones that we found. So, apologize if we didn't get to all of them. I mm-hmm. might do like a casual astrology podcast or something for patrons uh, talking about some of the other ones here before too long. Mm-hmm. Um, any other things you want to touch on or questions that you want to do before we wrap up this episode? Um, I would love to give an honorable mention to two really good questions. Okay. So one was by Etheric Astro, um, at Etheric Astro on Twitter. That's Giulio um, uh, Pellegrini. I would love to hear stories of how astrology has made a difference in people's lives, how it has impacted you, changed you, or been useful, either through study, being a part of a community, or through consultation or some other encounter. I thought that was a great, great broad question. Mm -hmm. Um, Do you have thoughts you'd like to share on that at all? Um, So it's kind of tied into the other one that was submitted by at Michael at Morris Michael J on Twitter, which is Michael Morris on Twitter, who says, "How does practicing astrology affect affect or inform how you think about things other than astrology? How has the actual practice affected your worldviews? Plus, how?" to think about experiences slash phenomenon beyond the field of astrology? I think those are two really rich questions um, that aren't really like quick answer questions, but I wanted to at least give them acknowledgement for asking really good questions, and then we could see if we had anything sort of briefly to to say in response to those. Sure. Um, Yeah, I would just say for me, um, getting into astrology in high school and originally not having any academic aspirations for college or something like that or 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 life after high school um when i got into astrology like astrology became the reason to study all of these other fields and suddenly having a reason to study history and philosophy and um science and mathematics and um so many different fields that were that were then applicable to astrology and that you needed to have some exposure to to um, understand astrology better <laughs> and to enhance your skills with astrology with. Mm-hmm. And that's been part of my personal odyssey over the course of, I guess, the last 20 years now mm-hmm. since I started learning astrology in 1999 slash 2000. And um, yeah, astrology becomes the reason to study a bunch of different things, at least for me, um, it became that because, again, circling around for like the third time now, the idea that you need to be like a jack of all trades in order to do astrology well. Mm. Is there like a better catchphrase for that? Because I keep Probably. saying, then, <laughs> yeah, because jack of all. I mean, it does make sense. Um, Swiss, yeah, no, Swiss Army knife, knife of astrology, a polymath. A polymath. That's a much yes. more eloquent, eloquent way <laughs> of saying. It is. Uh-huh. Well, that's what somebody like like Ptolemy, for example, was in the second century. I always like to refer to Ptolemy as he was a polymath because he wrote texts on several different fields. It wasn't just astrology, but also astronomy and um, harmonics, like music theory and mm-hmm. geography and a bunch of different stuff. And there's a lot mm-hmm. of astrologers in history that if they were not outright polymaths in that way, they had to learn a bunch of different things in order to do astrology. Mm-hmm. Like even just like mathematics, for example, in order to calculate charts by hand. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, in terms of the first question, how it's made a difference in people's lives, um, certainly the part about being part of a community has been very big for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's been really enriching. Kind of, um, even when many people are often at a distance geographically in the community of astrology, which is often true, um, you know, having a sense of like people not just sharing a worldview, but like being able to kind of, you know, pick apart and like understand the world in these ways, and and it's a language. I think many people agree, and yeah, and it becomes a shared language between practitioners. Mm-hmm, exactly. So that's pretty unique to have a community around, and I think that's been very gratifying to me. Yeah. 
Um, and also having, you know, I mean, I had a lot of experience with the organizations and community. And so that was something I explicitly involved myself in. And there's something, and this isn't, of course, unique to astrology, but um, there's something to be said for feeling that that sense of connection over time with like people who used to be around who are not anymore, but have kind of set the groundwork for whatever exists around astrology in the community today. And then, you know, being around long enough, even I feel like even so far, I've been able to see being around long enough to see new people coming into the community and seeing that they will, you know, like in turn pass this down when you're not around and so forth. I think that's um, there's something really valuable about that. Yeah, I mean, ironically, Julia, the one that asked the question is the president or the presiding officer of AFAN, which is AFAN's euphemism for the president, right? <laughs> um, of AFAN, which is the organization that you were previously the presiding officer of, and right. so he took over the organization from you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so I mean, community is a big piece. Yeah. So community lineage, mm -hmm. a greater sense of connectivity, connectedness to people. Mm -hmm. um, for me, it circles back to the philosophy thing from earlier in the fate discussion. And I guess the biggest thing with astrology is giving me a greater sense of meaning and purpose within the context of my life in general and the world in general, mm -hmm. and seeing the meaning and purpose in other people's lives. And I think there's something tremendously beneficial and useful and um, sort of not gratifying, but something beautiful about that and elegant about astrology as a system of meaning that shows a system of meaning that exists in the world in general that's like objectively out there. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that gets into like philosophical and religious realms, which maybe is part of the reason that astrology is historically sometimes um, gotten into conflict with different religions, mm -hmm. but it does provide a system for seeing the meaning and purpose in the universe that you might not otherwise see that's not otherwise evident there just like objectively unless you do follow some specific religion or some specific um, sect or doctrine that tells you that there is this meaning that, that exists. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's been huge for me as well. And I was kind of touching on that earlier a little bit as well, but um, you know, feeling like I am always been the sort of person where like what is the big picture, you know, asking why about everything or like what's behind everything that had always been kind of my orientation towards life. But I also am not particularly one to take things at face value or to take things just because someone says this is the way this works or to, you know, be faith based, you know, be like, I, I just believe that this this is the way that it is. So it really did fill a huge hole for me mm -hmm. in terms of like wanting to see a bigger picture but not seeing it for a while or not seeing one that like worked for me mm -hmm. for a while um you know being interested in religions and things like that but not feeling like very like a huge adherent of any one of them um and astrology for me became a way to see that there was something bigger happening in life even if you don't know the ultimate whys behind it i would still like to know the why but um you know, that's still something rather than nothing. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I feel like I had another thought about that. But basically, you know, it was a framework of meaning that I was missing before, and that was huge and continues to be. Yeah, definitely. Um, and definitely for me, it gave me something to strive towards as I wanted to be good at, at an astrologer and do whatever it took to be better as an astrologer. And part of what it took was learning different things and how they integrated into astrology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, I actually remembered my lost thought. Whereas um, I see religions, I mean, they they have complex roles in life, but one of them is kind of like ideas about how the world works. And for me, finding astrology, and I know this wouldn't be you know the same for everyone, but for me personally, it was kind of like, oh, okay, this isn't actually an idea about how this works. This is actually a piece of how it's working. Yeah, and that felt solid enough for me to be like, okay, there is a big picture and I can see it and I don't have to either believe it or disbelieve it. it I just see it in front of me. Yeah. Um, it's like this uh, source code that's like happening, underlying reality and suddenly you've like stumbled across it right. and you can like see the green like matrix letters that are like <laughs> moving in the background. 
when people are like doing meeting the love of their life or they're starting their most important work or they're moving into a new home or having a child or what have you and suddenly um yeah you can you can see or at least even just like a glimpse into what's going on and there's things mm -hmm. that are obscuring it including your own biases and um you know different issues like that but there's mm -hmm. something there that's tangible that's much more tangible that you can actually glimpse into without having to have some sort of intermediary through like a like a book or a scripture mm -hmm. or a or a you know priest or, or what have you it's mm -hmm. it's sort of there and accessible for you and maybe in that way astrology is one of the most um accessible forms of developing and seeing a broader philosophy or philosophical system um because of that that tangibility or that accessibility mm -hmm. True. Although, although is it accessible maybe it's it, it's tricky because it actually takes a long time to learn it, it becomes a lifelong study and a lifelong mystery that nobody ever completely unravels or answers that you're always learning that's that's so broad and all encompassing that it can't be fully mastered by any one person in any one lifetime. Mm -hmm. So maybe there's still a level of inaccessibility to it, but it's the glimpse into it and the ability to to do that on your own that maybe makes it so appealing. Mm -hmm, for sure. And I think I wanted to add that this isn't necessarily saying that this is the only thing going on in the universe, you know? Mm -hmm. Like this shows you a lot. It may not, it may, for all I know, still not show you everything. There may be other things that we don't see that are still happening. Mm -hmm. But um, so I don't want to kind of privilege that and make it into like a fundamentalism or something. Like now I know the answer, you know? Right. But you know some of the answer at the very least and some pretty gratifying pieces of the answer. Yeah, definitely. Um, all right, and Michael says, how does practicing astrology affect or inform how you think about things other than astrology? Just that everything often then gets placed in an astrological context. Like we'll, we'll read, I'll read like history books or something, and we'll be interested because we'll, you know, you read about let's say like the American Revolution or something like that, and you're like, mm -hmm. oh, like I'd like to see what was going on in the chart at that time, and you're like, mm -hmm. oh, Uranus was discovered within a decade of the American Revolution, and so mm -hmm. you start filtering things through that. Um, lens astrologically, and maybe I don't think it's just me. Maybe I do it more, even more than than some astrologers. But I think most astrologers start filtering everything in their life through the lens of astrology, mm -hmm. which I hesitate to say because that sounds a little bit um, not good. That right. it could potentially be not good. It could potentially be problematic in a wide variety of different ways. Mm -hmm. But there's also ways in which that can be, you know, really interesting, really fascinating. Right. Yeah. And I wish I had a contrasting answer, but I do think of it in many of the same ways. Like, so I do use astrology as kind of like a major framework through which I understand things, mm -hmm. you know, and other, or other topics in life. Um, definitely agree with the history. I actually wasn't inherently interested in history before. It was sort of like one of those topics I was less interested than average um, until I learned astrology. And then that actually made it really interesting because you can kind of go back and see the different trends at different points in time and like pivot points and what was happening at pivotal points in history. And so that made it a lot more fascinating than it seemed to be inherently before. Yeah. I mean, um, there's literally like any discipline or any area of life, any study you could um, get into and then try to like approach or look at through an astrological lens and like combine those studies. So there's like history, for example, and like historical cycles, like outer planet cycles, mm -hmm. and different the rise and falls of different empires or the foundations of charts of different cities, different mundane astrology things that were happening. There's um, you know music. People mm -hmm. have applied astrology to music, like the birth charts of um, famous musicians or when famous musicians wrote their most important pieces or compositions or mm -hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, when certain comp compositions, like the debut of that mm -hmm. and the chart for that. So music, um, medicine. I know you're reading a, bo a book on medical astrology recently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a, there's literally anything, you know, that you can think about can have an astrological piece to it or a framework. Um, yeah. I think about like, go ahead. I mean, just, I want to run through like a few more. I mean, okay. what are the <laughs> other ones like economics? 
studying sure. like mundane trends in economics, economics. Or, or businesses and studying like in, in corporation charts stock market stock market mm -hmm. um yeah like bitcoin people doing bitcoin astrology or stock market astrology mm -hmm. um philosophy is a huge field and mm -hmm. obviously the philosophical implications which we keep going back into at different points the philosophical implications of astrology itself but also like the astrology of different philosophers is actually really interesting yeah and you can see like of course they thought this because this was the kind of person they were right you know yeah that's actually really cool yeah how the birth chart influenced their philosophy mm. or maybe even the development of different periods in philosophy and mundane astrology mm -hmm. um, as well as just like core issues like fate and free will was an issue already before astrology came along and then the way that that issue becomes an issue or the other issue about like um what is it are, are people born at the blank slate versus mm -hmm. how yeah. much are they um conditioned by you know events and circumstances or the context right. of their life right yeah yeah uh what else what other fields are there um all the social sciences oh yeah so like um psychology sociology anthropology all those things right um that actually that was my undergrad area, but it's interesting. I'd actually thought about this specifically because of getting into astrology after having degrees in that, because my undergrad degree, I went to a weird college and um, they were all interdisciplinary degrees. Hmm. And so my um, degree was actually called self society and culture, which is basically meant you took courses in psychology, sociology, and anthropology. And so you saw that there were different spheres of influence, overlapping spheres of influence going on within the personality, within um, one's culture, and within you know the sociology or how your society was arranged. And so when I learned astrology, I was like, yeah, of course, you know, there's just another layer. And there's all these different layers. It's not just one thing. Yeah. Um, or like r religious studies and the history of different religions mm -hmm. and their and their sometimes intertwining or uh, convergence and divergence with astrology. Mm -hmm. um, I know when I got into ancient Greek astrology, um, I started learning Greek. And one of the ways they did that was using a textbook called The Basics of Biblical Greek mm -hmm. by William Mounts, I think is the name. And you learn biblical Greek from like New Testament Greek, and you realize that many of the same Greek terms that are used in the Christian New Testament, the Bible, are used by astrologers as like technical terms. And then mm -hmm. you see the interesting like interchange and interplay between the two. So it becomes a reason to learn languages and stuff. Right. Um, so both ancient languages as well as like other languages. Cause like if you only know English, but you don't know French, if you learned French, then all of a sudden you unlock hundreds of years of other astrological texts that were written in other languages that may contain observations and thoughts and research by astrologers that were otherwise inaccessible to you up to that point. Mm -hmm. So it's like a reason to learn other languages. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of what we've said so far is that it gives you another layer of understanding of these different subjects. Mm -hmm. Do you agree? Yeah. A different layer of understanding those subjects and also a reason to learn other subjects to become a better astrologer and in, in the mm -hmm. service of being the best astrologer you can be, which then circles back to some of the earlier questions about like counseling skills and things like that, and just mm -hmm. how many different or, or learning horary in addition to natal astrology and all the different things that you want to try and learn to be well rounded as an astrologer, even if you end up going into a specific um, specialty or specialty field. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we've covered um, quite a few questions. We've mm -hmm. had some good discussions, very far-ranging discussions as we we typically do. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, any final thoughts as we're as we're wrapping up? Um, I don't know about final thoughts that sum up all the different questions we were addressing. Um, thank you, everyone, for sending in your questions because lots of people did, and of course, we can only only get to a select few of them. Um, yeah. Yeah, thanks everyone for sending in questions through Twitter and Facebook and Patreon. Um, I'll think about doing like another maybe casual podcast to answer some more questions since there's always tons of leftovers right. or, or a lot of great ones that we just didn't have time to do because we already made this like almost three hours yeah. just going through a handful of them. Mm -hmm. um, but it's always fun. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot for, for joining me and doing this with me today. Quite welcome. All right. Um, and I guess that's it for this episode of the Astrology Podcast. So let me switch there.
Thanks, everybody, for listening to this episode of the Astrology Podcast. Um, thanks to, again, just celebrating 50,000 subscribers on YouTube. Um, we appreciate you. And um, I, I guess that's this is the last episode for September of 2020. So I'll mm -hmm. be back again next month with more episodes in October. Let me know if there's any topics you'd like to see me cover in the next um, you know, set of episodes. And I guess we're nearing so I've been saying, have I been saying 170? It's 273, episode oh, 273. Oh, is it 273? Yeah. I think you were saying 173 okay. before. <laughs> I've done way too many episodes. So we've actually, it's 273 because we celebrated last year, episode 200. Right, that makes So we're sense. actually coming up on episode 300 here for, before too long. So we're going to have to think mm. about what to do for that mm. to celebrate that one. Cake. Cake? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> we'll see. Um. All right. Uh, thanks, everyone, for listening to the Astrology Podcast, and we'll see you again next time. Thanks for listening. Special thanks to the patrons who support the Astrology Podcast through our page on patreon.com. In particular, shout out to the patrons that are on our producers tier, such as Christine Stone, Nate Craddock, Marin Altman, Thomas Miller, Bear River, Catherine Conroy, Michelle Marillot, Christy Moe, and Sumo Kopic. Find out more about how to become a patron at patreon.com slash astrologypodcast. Also, thanks to our sponsors this month, which include the AstroGold Astrology app, available at astrogold.io, the Portland School of Astrology at portlandastrology.org, the Honeycomb Collective Personal Astrological Almanacs, available at honeycomb.co, and also the International Society for Astrological Research, which is hosting an online conference September 12th through the 13th, 2020. Find out more information at esar2020.org, as well as the Northwest Astrological Conference, which is happening May 27th through the 31st, 2021, and you can find out more information about that at norwac.net. Finally, the software we use here on the Astrology Podcast is called Solar Fire Astrology Software, and it's available through alabe.com and you can get a 15% discount with the promo code AP15.